child. Yes, I'm a child, happily. Many of us, we don't know that we are children. When you are reading your Bible, you say, you are a child of God. We are children of God. Did you say, the uh, Bible says you are a man of God or a woman of God? You are children. You are a child. 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 Even if you are 90, you are a child. Child. Yes. <laughs> so, are you done? Hmm? Are you done? Oh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I want to talk about children. Okay. I want to talk about children, you know. <sighs> yeah, but you know, the the it, it gets me. Um, I'm really concerned that we are not really giving the children the attention that they deserve, and we don't even know that we do it so strongly. It's painful and inadvertently. And inadvertently. But like I was explaining to you, it is a function of where we're coming from in our time. You didn't talk about children. You didn't talk to them. You, you, they were just there. And then things evolved, and then you had International Children's Day, International Year of, year the, of child, the Child, 19, 1979. And then you are making policies to improve the well-being of children. All that is new to us, and we're mouthing all those things because the UN says we should. I, I was speaking with a, we're going to have a further conversation about this this morning, thankfully, but I was speaking with a, um, a child, behavioral, whatever the English word that they use is, and she was saying something like, when I was just asking, just to get some background into the discussion, I said, mm. look, why, what is it, you know, that government ought to do about children, that we don't know what kind of policies, that we make policies for children all the time, we just don't know. I said, Really? said so every policy that is made has a direct or indirect consequence on the children. Uh -huh. I, it was like it stung me like I'd never heard it before. Well, that is true. If you um, extort too much money from the parents in forms of taxes, levies, and all those things, the children the are children directly. Directly. Yeah. Because yeah. it affects anything they do. If you, if you um, raise um, the cost of uh, petrol, diesel, whatever it is, it reduces quite some that the children should have. Uh, they, all kinds of things. Really? Wow. It is true. So we essentially mm. do not care about the children, but we don't even know. <sighs> And we should care, because that's where it all starts. When ASU is going on strike, do we have any idea the direct consequence on the children? Do he sue, I understand, is that they are on strike or about, I think they, they, they started, said they wanted to start strike. And are we aware of the direct impact on the children? Hmm. Children. Children. We were children at some point. You said yeah. it the other time. Yeah. And I, what I've yeah. also been, even been told these days is, you can't even think of raising children the way you were raised. You can't. Anyway, keep your gunpowder dry. Okay. We're talking Children's Day in the body of the program. I'm sorry. So I'm slow sorry. down, slow down, slow okay. down. Okay. Yes, I, I want to know your thoughts about what the Minister of Education said in the course of the week, that he had no idea what the Ministry of Education was about when he was made the minister. Oh, well, he said it. Yes, he said it. Mm -hmm. So, and it's no cause for legislation. Oh, okay. No cause for alarm. Okay, all right, fine. It, it, I think it okay. really underscores a number, one of the things that, are, that has been said, mm. you know, by a good number of, I think, lawmakers and even some civil society organizations. That mm. look, when you are assigning, and I'm hoping that they the incoming government, either at the federal or state levels, will do this. When you come into government and you want to send a list of nominees to the National Assembly, could you kindly send with their prospective portfolios? Their prospective portfolios? <laughs> because if the CBN governor is to be screened by the National Assembly, it is clear he is going to be 
CBN governor. Yeah. If the chairman of the NDDC is going to the National Assembly, it is clear, unambiguous, yeah. he's going to be chairman or whatever, GM, MD yeah. of the NDDC. Yeah. So if we can have that for some ministries, departments, and agencies, why not for other ministries, all ministers? And add that to the fact that according to uh, Professor Skeyamo, um, the Minister of State Portfolio is redundant. <laughs> in other words, he's saying he didn't have much to do, or he hasn't had much to do in the last eight years. He actually said it's unconstitutional, that there is no provision for what's Minister, what's of, what's State. Minister of State. J junior Minister. Uh, yeah. Well, it does his CV good. Oh, well, yeah. He said it. How um, about that? He said it. He said, I mean, it, it breathes his, uh, his CV, so. No, his profile. <laughs> well, mm. I guess that's a good thing. Yeah, indiscipline on the roads. Oh. <sighs> Honestly, we, we don't have any more time because we have quite a long list. But you, you mm. see, that indiscipline, I don't know. You know, we have at least 16 states in Nigeria that have one form of LASMA or the other. So who enforces traffic laws. Who does? In Kano, in Kaduna, in Delta, in Zamfara, Zamfara in Sokoto. Oyo. There are tons, Abia. Of, tons of, of, of examples that mm. one could give. Yeah, People yeah. driving willingly against traffic and not giving a... Uh, what's that? Rats, bum bum. Who, how, who is affected by it? I don't even know. Then let's, let, let's just go Did to Did you this. say that on air? No, no, no. What was that? Okay. <laughs> to the menu. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about the Nigerian child. That's what we're going to start this morning. Yes, please. Mm. And um, after that... Them. Yes, yes. We children. Mm. Yes. And that will be followed by a conversation around laparoscopy... Pros uh oh Pros Laparoscopic... Pros Prostatectomy. You will understand what that means. It's uh, from Reddington <laughs> Hospital's milestone uh, later on on the show. Christ. And then we, we go to Echo, my Lagos. Mm. What's that all about? You need to stick with us to find out. Then um, Lagos, this is the only one that has two names. Echo, Lagos. <laughs> and then this one. You know, you've seen why, why people act the way they do. And today, you will know why children act the way they do and what you should do when they do. <laughs> and then we shall end, as is usual, on Sunrise with the Artist of the Week segment. Yeah, and that's, today it's all about children. So that's the way we're going to... Uh, you just, you know, keep, as you said the other time, keep your gunpowder dry. I don't even know who you do. That's right. What do you do with gunpowder? Paint your face or something? No, if you don't keep it dry, if, if you wet it, then it, it wouldn't fire. Oh. Uh -huh. Okay, please. Keep, um, no. Keep your cocoa powder wet in the bottle, in the, in the cup. We'll be right back. Or your cocoa. Oh, yeah. That, that will be white. We'll be right back. Yeah, I want to get it right
child. Okay, let me not get emotional. Let me not. Let me try not to get emotional this morning. According to data, Nigeria is a country of the young. Almost half the entire population is said to be under the under age 15? of 15. Ouch. About 46%. We are having children like rabbits. Excuse my French. We are having children, period. Please. Oh. Guess what? Let's make, let me make it better. More than half, I think about 70% or thereabout, mm -hmm. of Nigerians are below age 35. Okay. So we young people, we... <laughs> Asiko, how are you today? See, as I said, a little <laughs> over one in three of Nigeria's whole population it's also said to live below the poverty line, which makes oh, it... Dear. Now, the picture is bright, and then suddenly it goes dark. Nigeria accounts for more than one in five of out-of-school children in the world. Primary education is officially free and compulsory, but only 67% of eligible children take up a place. How many, how many primary schools are really free in Nigeria? That's a question for one government official. I wish we had one here. Okay, all right. If a child misses school for even a short time, there's a very low chance, only about 25%, that the child will ever return. This is, not, mm. this is talking about their, ed their health, their, their education. Mm. We haven't even gone to the space of their health. Their health. We've not gone to the space of their mental health. We've not gone to the space of their social well-being. So, uh, and then... Children don't take care of themselves. Someone or some people take care of them. And as we mentioned earlier, what affects the parents directly affects the children. Let's have some conversation this morning with um, two gentlemen who are here with us and hopefully one or two other persons who will join us in the course of time. Uh, let me welcome, first of all, the, the fellow child, Olari Waji Okoyemi, who is a bronze winner. Fellow child, co-child. Yes, bronze winner, a silver participant, international award for young people in Nigeria. So a student of State Senior High School, Alimosho. Thank you for joining us this morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning. morning. Thank you. And, um, of course, we have National Director, International Award for Young People in Nigeria, Oshoke Bello. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Pleasure to be here. Um... Larry Waju, I may be asking you some very difficult questions. Not the kind that your teachers give you um, lectures or what, what's that thing they give you? Exams. Exams. Mm -hmm. Don't look beyond your parents. Generally, do you think children, first of all, how old are you, if you don't mind me asking? I'll be 18. You'll be 18, so you are not yet 18, so you are not an adult yet, good. <laughs> so, do you think children are, that governments at various levels care about children? Yeah, let me first start by acknowledging the Honorable Commissioner for Education of Legal State, um, Honorable um, she has been taking care of us right from primary school. I remember when I was in primary one. Okay, I'm taking like this. I remember when I was in primary one, um, my English was so bad. And the only thing we could do was to organize a co curricular activities whereby um, we take phonics. And there was this, um, my teacher that was taking me phonics then, and she started grooming me. Then I remembered how we stay back to like, okay, this is how you go, this is how you do this. Um, so that's after school hours. Yeah. yeah. And I remember back then, the only thing I could say is yes, no, yes, no. But now with the apps of phonics, 
and continuous learning, I've been able to at least come to a balance in English language. How, how and, many, my apologies, how many children from what you know do you think, can you say have had the kind of opportunity you have had? There are thousands of children across Nigeria generally. Um, in Lagos, in the school, I would say we have close to 1,000 students. And just in a country like um, our country, Nigeria, we have more than 300,000 schools. So I can boldly say that more than thousands of students, in fact, millions, they've been able to encounter this stage of learning. The only thing is, I mean, if the data is right, then, and um, you're saying that, you know, this is the story, according to data, one in five out of school children, or one fifth of out of school children in the world are in Nigeria. And that's mm -hmm. not a small number, but we'll, we'll come yeah. back to you. Well, mm -hmm. Mr. Billo, you've listened to him. Um, you might have a broader understanding or perspective of the issues. Do you think we, as a nation, care enough about children? Um, thank you very much. Uh, I think I'll, rather, I'll begin from what uh, your co said earlier, and that's the fact that what affects the adults also affects the child, because children are products of the people that they deal with, and of course the things that are around them. And the society itself also has a very, very big role to play um, in issues affecting children. Now, I would look at it from the angle of um, there is the societal part of it, there's also the government's you know, role, and then, of course, the family role as well. But as say, it seems now, right now, one particular aspect, or one particular area is having a bigger influence on others, which means that, just like you mentioned, what affects the adults would indirectly also affect the child. You know, children, just like you also mentioned earlier, cannot take care of themselves. They are being brought in by parents mm -hmm. who came together and said, okay, we want to bring in this child. And so the, the decisions that they would make at that stage of their life are not 100% totally theirs. They are down to influences from the adults who brought them in. They are down to suggestions from friends, from associations, relationships. So there's a lot you know, that brings into this divide. Now, down to your question, I think the government has several initiatives that they have put in place. But in terms of tailoring it down, does it get to the grassroots? I mean, you've read some certain figures, figures that we are all familiar with. Even the Honourable Minister for, Youth, for Education also acknowledged that feed those figures as well. But in terms of how has this now been reduced? We all hear of issues of, especially up, up north, many young people are not able to go to school anymore because of rising insecurity and all that. And then you also mentioned a very crucial figure. Many young people who get out of school or who miss school for certain reasons or the other, a large percentage of them don't, don't find their way back in. So there is a lot at various levels. Um, he was, I, I would say, he was quite privileged to have that experience you know, of um, being guided or being mentored you know, in terms of phonics and all that. Yeah. But many young people don't. Yeah. I mean, you would share from your own experience that you, know, you see people who go through school, finish exams and WIEC and all those things, and then you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't level up, yeah. it doesn't balance up. Uh, uh, Mr. Miller, uh, this experience is it the same for the girl child? Because I know that in some areas, the girl child is disadvantaged. How bad is it with the girl child? Yeah, the experience is quite different, really, with the girl child. I think there are so many, so many factors, especially in our country like ours, that affect the girl child. Um, we have, of course, we have the Child Rights Act, which clearly states the rights of a child. But then this act is also being circumvented by various other factors, religion, ethnicity, mm. just to mention a few. So the divide is quite huge. And you know, the, the, the girl child is, is quite disadvantaged, really. Um, it's quite disadvantaged. And um, a lot of efforts need to be put in place you mm. know, to, to bridge that gap, to bridge that gap in help, make, making the voice of the girl child to be heard a whole lot more. The, the Child's uh, Rights Act of 2003, yeah. um, do, 
do you think we're just mouthing it? How many states, for instance, have domiciled it? Number one. Number two, how many of those states are enforcing what that act says? Yeah, so um, from last statistics, not so many of the states are actually you know, enforcing the, the sections or the requirements of the Child Rights Act. I think, yes, I think it's just with every um, policy here in Nigeria, they exist. But I think a lot needs to be done in terms of following it through, implementation. Um, one very important part of the, of the Child Rights Act is you know, uh, the right to security. You know, a child whose parents has done the needful in sending a child to school and then all of a sudden gets a phone call and says, oh, your child has been kidnapped. Mm. You know, there are limits to where a, where a parent's uh, supervision or guidance ends. Mm. Or even, you know, in private schools where, you know, you go home and then you get a report or oh, your child was molested. So again, it's... Um, it's so the child, the child is not quite adequately protected? Yes. Even in controlled environments like school? Yes. Uh, and that, that's the first point of exposure for education for okay. a child outside the family. Mm -hmm. Okay, let, let, let's bring in um, the, uh, Mr. Yomifawemi, who is an HR consultant but has been an enthusiast, you know, an education enthusiast for quite a while. Um, uh, Mr. Afawemi, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you. Good morning, and thanks for having me. And right. happy, happy Children's Day to all yes, of us. Yes, to all of us. Yes, <laughs> thank you. And we also have uh, Sandra Luadare, who is a parenting coach and child behavior consultant. Uh, both of them join us virtually this morning. Uh, Madam, thank you for joining us. Okay. While we're waiting for her, let, 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 let me bring you in, uh, Mr. Fawemi. You heard the, the, the last comment uh, from... Um, Mr. Bello, uh, about the, the environment, the, the education environment where the child is supposed to feel safest, so to speak, but unfortunately doesn't feel so safe because of the security challenges. And we've had conversations around, around this for quite a while, safe school initiative, you name it. So what do you think is missing here? Well, thank, thank, thanks for having me. Again, happy Children's Day to all the children in Nigeria. Uh, it's a privilege to be a child. And uh, I think one thing we need to accept and agree to is the fact that the Nigerian state is responsible for children because the principal responsibility for a child belongs to the state. Actually, the law empowers the state. By the state, I mean the state called Nigeria, not a state level of government, but the whole entire gamut of uh, statehood of Nigeria. The law empowers the state to even take over the responsibility where it fails. So the state has, has not done enough. And there have been talks about security, there have been talks about threats. Uh, but so for me, at, at the base of the problem that we have with the Nigerian child, the threat to the Nigerian child is the lack of capacity or lack of seriousness of the state. Uh, my dear friend in the studio that started, uh, when he was started, he, when he started the conversation, he said he wants to thank the commissioner for education. So question, first question to ask is that, why is he thanking the commissioner for education? First question to ask, why is the child thanking the commissioner for education? If you unpack that, appreciation, you understand what we're talking about. This child feels a gratitude to the Commissioner for Education. But the question we need to ask ourselves is that in Nigeria, we have a Minister for Women Affairs. In Nigeria, many states have a Commissioner for Women Affairs. Why is there no Minister or Commissioner for Children? In many countries of the world, there is a dedicated cabinet person for the, child, for the child. So what then happens in Nigeria is that, and as this appreciation that this our friend has given, when a child is threatened in the school, the Commissioner for Education in all the states, they, they stand up to it. But when that same child is threatened outside of the school, nobody talks about it. We had cases in Lagos, for example, in the last couple of years where children have unfortunately died in school and the Commissioner for Education and the Ministry of Education rose up to it. But you remember there was a time we had about five, six children that died in a car in Lagos due to suffocation. Did you hear any information from any commissioner? The reason is because we have made child issues in Nigeria an education issue. So hmm. a child who is threatened in the school has a lot of government attention. 
because the government says that the, the government structure is that when a child is in school, there's the role of the commissioner for education. But if that child dies in the market or that child dies in the cartoon to suffocation, everybody keeps quiet. As if that child is not a child. Well, Mr. So Fahimi, part, part of the, yes. my, I, so part of the lack of... Just, just a sorry, second, just a second. Just, okay. just explicit on that a little bit further so that the context is not only not lost but also understood better. It is true, I mean, because the moment you said when uh, an education issue arises, uh, that's where we put children, Alara was nodding her head in, in agreement. But it doesn't happen in hospitals. It doesn't happen in, at the airports. It doesn't happen at the sports centers. What is missing? Yeah, what is missing, like I'm trying to explain, is the fact that there is no focus on the Nigerian child. Mm. You have a ministry of women affairs. You have a ministry of youth. There is no ministry of the child. Many countries of the world, including Canada, have a minister that has accountability for children. Some call it children and family, for example. So when anything happens to a child, that person takes responsibility for it. Either something happened to a child or something should happen for it. There is no deliberate focus on a Nigerian child. We had a case in Egypt where a school bus was conveying children to school and the school bus derailed. And as a result of that, three ministers, I think two or three ministers resigned. That's what happens when a country is serious about children. I'm going to give you some, some statistics. The National Bureau of Statistics just gave, uh, gave release of the MIC that talked about the number of states that met the target of under five mortality in Nigeria. That's the number of children that died before five. Out of 36 states, only four states met the target. That's Lagos, that's Anambra, Eboi, and Oshu states. Only four states met the target. Check the last election. Those states had election. Why did the state voters in the state not give a feedback to those leaders? In fact, there is a state in the southwest. I'm not going to mention so I don't get misunderstood. Rather than reduce the number of under five mortality, it increased. The governor contested for election and won a second term. So we have a situation where the government is not focused on the child. Okay. We have a situation where the voters are not using their poor performance in managing a Nigerian child so, to vote uh, them out. Yeah, so I, I, it, I think, I think that, underscores, that underscores a very important point there, there uh, Mr. Fawin. Well, let, let me bring in uh, uh, Mr. Luwa Dari, um, who is a parenting coach and child behavior consultant. You know, when we began, and uh, you, you may also want to speak to some of the issues that uh, she, she heard. Okay, I, I understand that she's not ready yet. But uh, Mr. Uh, Opoyemi, what, which one is your surname? Olariwaju. Olariwaju is your surname. Okay, Mr. Olariwaju. You've heard him. You've also heard your uh, Mr. Uh, Bello speak to some of these issues. I asked you when we started, do you think there is enough focus on children? Do you think children are well taken care of? In the context of what you have heard so far, do you still think so? Mm, I'll give it a 50-50. Um, okay. Number one, because if a child is not in school, then we should speak to the parents. Because as a parent, if you are grooming your child right from when he or she is young, um, you, okay, let me put it like this. Um, you groom your child in the way of God as it is to be, um, that's the first thing to put first. And um, when you are young, when the child is young, you are grooming him, uh, you need to go to school, you need to do this, do assignments, do classwork, and others. Um, the child starts to get interest in what he or she is learning. And when the child is exposed, um, he feels that ah, my friends are doing this. Let me also join them. Okay. So it is that grooming that the parent had given to the child that would determine if the child is going to adhere to what he or she is exposed to. So essentially you're saying education is one of, one of if not the most important in the life of a child. Uh, it's a 50-50. Okay. Because 
Don't worry, we'll, we'll talk about the other 50. <laughs> well, let, let's, let, let's quickly uh, take uh, Ms. Ulua Dari on. I understand she's uh, ready for us now. Thank you for okay. joining us this morning, madam. Thank you so much for having me. Um, <laughs> speaking from the policy perspective, I mean, you are a child behavior consultant. You are also a parenting coach. But let's, uh, the, the, we began by asking the question of whether or not as a country, we are giving enough attention to children. From what you have seen yeah. in your practice, in your experience, speaking with parents, speaking with all kinds of stakeholders in your, in your career, what have you seen in that regard? Thank you so much for that question, and happy Children's Day to all the children. Yes, so, thank you. Um, I will say that so much more needs to be done so far. It's obvious that much attention is not given to the child holistically, you know, not just um, from the family units, but the society as a whole. Because when it comes to, you know, raising children, we're talking about uh, the family unit as the bedrock of the society. We're talking about a unit where people are, you know, raised to go back into the society to make impact, to affect humanity positively. So if a unit such as the family is going to make so much impact in the society, I think much more, um, much more awareness or much more support needs to be created you know, for proper child um, development because I mean, if we are not paying attention to the kind of people we are producing, the child who is five years old today is going to be 15 in the next 10 years. So if we're not, if all things are not in place that is supposed to um, help the child become wholesome and well-balanced, that child in a few years is going to go into the society. And if one child can create so much change, if one adult can create so much change. One adult who is well raised. Now you can imagine how much havoc a child who is not well raised can create as well. So just to be clear, uh, madam, a uh, quick one. Just to be clear, uh, you said a number of things need to be done, and if those things are not done, um, we will have a malnourished or uh, on a child that is not raised well. What are these things? Uh, Mr. Fawemi, while speaking the other time, says the only box we seem to put children is in the education box. No health, social welfare. You talked about the child going into society. Uh, so what is missing in the mix? We can take for granted that education, the education ambit or the education docket is taken care of, assumably. What, is, what other things are missing in the entire uh, uh, sphere of child care? Okay. okay, thank you so much for that question. So we need to begin to look at other areas aside from education, like you said. Now, how are we, what kind of soft skills are we empowering our children with? What kind of you know, skills are we equipping them with? Are they really prepared to go out there? Are they really prepared to go into the society? So we're talking about empowering our children with skills such as um, executive functioning skills, communication skills, because we find that when people get into the workplace, for example, some people come in with trauma, some people come in with their own mindset, you know, their own programming, the way they have been raised from home. But we realize that Parents sometimes raise their children as if they are going to be tied to their apron strings forever, forgetting that a time will come when these children are going to go into the society. So we need to niche down on skills such as executive functioning skills, children being able to communicate properly, children being able to speak up, because most times we find that children are hushed. I mean, they are not allowed to express their emotions. For example, a child comes to you and, and says, oh, my pencil got broken. And the child is crying and you're saying, uh oh, so we have a box of pencils. Is that why you're crying? I can just give you another one. So what are we teaching that child? Well, making the child understand that your feelings do not really matter and you can as well, you know, just 
keep your feelings to yourself. Now that child grows up, the child doesn't know how to manage his emotions. The child doesn't know. In fact, the child is okay with stifling his emotions. Now that child goes into the workplace. How is he going to relate with other people? And when emotions have been kept, you know, bottled up for a, for a long period of time, the day that person is going to let it out, you know, it might not just end well. So we have skills like emotions management, emotional intelligence. We have skills such as negotiation, you know, children who will grow up and will be well balanced. So it's not about um, just being okay educational, educationally. We're talking about a well balanced learning. We're talking about children who are able to thrive you know, wherever they find themselves. Okay. So I think we need to focus more on other skills aside numeracy, literacy, and all of that. We should be able to turn out children who can stand, you know, wherever they find themselves and navigate through life, you know, successfully. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Fawaimi, um, we can't talk about children and not talk about the number of children out of school, especially in Nigeria. And um, I think we should appreciate that the number is so high as a result of poverty. I know that there is a law in this country that says that children of, especially primary school, that every child is entitled to a primary school education. But that is not being enforced by anybody. And we're told that children up to about 13, 14 cannot even read two words in the language of their learning. How do you think we can begin to tackle this? Because it looks like instead of growing an educated, literate society, we are actually moving backwards. We're retrogressing. We're, we're, we're having more and more illiterate people in our country. How do we begin to take care of that? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thanks, thanks for the question. I mean, the question of out of school children is it, a, a very painful thing. I mean, I don't know how many times we have had this conversation on this channel about the, the, the fact that the numbers of children out of school is increasing, and it seems as if nobody cares about it. Uh, the commission, the Minister for Education, at the end of his tenure in 2019, apologized to Nigerians and said he wished to reduce the number of children out of school. Uh, he admitted he did not do enough. And the president appointed him for another four years. I mean, you see, at the being of the problem of the child, whether I educate, is it government? Now, we have a situation where we have a child right act. We have the UBEC law, for example, that criminalizes not sending your child to school. Who should enforce that those laws? Ooh. It is still the government. And it is still government. I mean, to be very precise, it's this government that has the biggest opportunity to make a well, difference. Well, Mr. Fawemi, let's, let's drill down. When you say it is government, which one? <laughs> which agency of government? Which individual in government? Uh, so, again, I come back to the fact that the government is not really serious. So when government wanted to tackle corruption, what did they do? They set up EFCC and ICPC to focus on corruption as a crime. When government wanted to tra the, tackle the question of child tra of, of trafficking, they set up NAPTIP to focus on trafficking. If government wants to focus on ensuring children go back to school, then they should set up a special part of the Nigerian police force whose duty is it to enforce children going to school. All those parents should be in jail by now. And I'm not saying we should do something we're not doing before. The, the presidential candidate of the PDP, when he was a child, his father was arrested for not sending him to school. So I'm talking about what we were doing 40, 70 years back. His father, the father of Araji Atiku Abuga, was arrested for not sending him to school. That's why he went to school. That was the choice he had. He had to make a trade-off to send him to school. I grew up in Ibadan. I remember governors like Paul Taffa. I particularly remember the former governor of Oyo State. That's the old Oyo State that is the current Oyo and Oshun State, Paul Taffa, in Ibadan. Then you dare not, you dare not even talk about the child did not go to school. It goes around Ibadan between 8 and 8.30 in the morning. Any child who is late to school, Again, remember the current governors are sleeping over children not in school. Any child who is on the road to school after eight, Paul Taffa effectively disciplines you on the road. 
Now, so at the end of the day, it is the role of the government. We had the, the massive, I mean, the, the, the Commonwealth recorded it as the biggest and massive public uh, radical change in public education in the whole of the Commonwealth between 1955 and 1960. Because the Western government of uh, Chief Abbefemi Lowell decided to make it an issue. So we will not have more children in school because parents are sending their children to school. You know, people will say, some parents, uh, the data from MBS says the biggest reason why children are not in school is that many parents do not see the reason why the child should be in school. Mm. That's what the data says. It's not money. It's not lack of school. Mm. That's what the data shows us in Nigeria today, that it is They don't see reason why they should send their children to he school. He raises a question, uh, Mr. Fawemi, my apologies. Uh, let, let me ask you that question, uh, Mr. Bello. The question was already brewing on my mind before uh, he got to this particular point. How functional is the education, education curriculum that you know that we have today from nursery to primary to secondary to university education levels. All right, thank you very much. Um, I think this week, that it just coincided that this week I was um, at an education summit, uh, which also we had the Honorable Commissioner for Education come and, come and speak. We had a special advisor to the governor on education also come in to speak. Now, um, I think the discussion then was around the future trends in education. Um, I work for a charity organization that focuses on promoting learning both within and outside the walls of the classroom. I think we have, our curriculum now is still a bit stereotyped. And um, truth be told, it's not helping us to produce the graduates that can actually compete out there. Um, the world trend is talking about AI, artificial intelligence, it's talking about chat GTP, you know, quite a lot in metaverse and all. Is there a, you, 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 you've been through school. You probably have, you have an idea what I'm talking about. Is there a, 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 a what well, I call it, a course or whatever, a subject in place that addresses that? You go through secondary school, the focus is on passing, WIAC, NECO, ski subjects, chemistry, physics, biology. And all. You go to the university, you go through. But even in the university, is the focus around exposing young people to experiences. I feel that our curriculum needs to look at how young people can be exposed better to experiences. A, a young person will discover themselves, whether no matter what, no matter what you do or you impose do, on do, them, what you they will them. still in, discover themselves. Mm -hmm. So why not create the opportunity, create a curriculum that is more robust towards helping young people discover themselves, what young people think, towards building, towards em emotional intelligence, how to relate with people out there. Because many young people are a product of what they see and what they experience. Now imagine growing up in a house where you know, the mother looks down on the housemaid, looks down on everybody, and then the same child will do the same thing in school. That's why you have issues of bullying and all, because they feel like, OK, this is something I've learned, something I, I, mm. I've, I've encountered. So mm. definitely, it's right, and it's the norm, and so I practice it. Yeah. So I think our curriculum should, be, should now re be, should actually be revised and looking into how do we help young people expose themselves to experiences. OK, let's practicalize this <laughs> right, right here. <laughs> Okay, Amy. Yes. What do you want to be when you grow up? Um, I wanted to be... You wanted? Yeah. You I changed wanted... your mind? Yeah, I'm changing my mind. Oh, now. okay. So because let's hear what you wanted to be earlier. I plan to be a computer scientist. Okay. But as things goes on, I see that the um, population in computer science is becoming too much. And there are other aspects like cloud engineering, where they deal with storage. It is not rampant in the society like that. Mm -hmm. And it is something that can fetch money as, you know, what... So you want to work in computers? Yeah. OK. So the education you're getting now, how much are you getting that is guiding you towards this thing that you want to achieve as your life goal? Um, it's not as if um, they are taking me through the path of going to the university to learn those particular courses. But there are other side programs that I feel is helping me to achieve my such as? such as the International Award for Young People Nigeria program. This is um, a global framework that has been set to empower young people from the age of 14 to 24. Um, so it is not what you are learning in class that is really guiding you? 
what I'm learning in class is guiding me towards going into the university to learn what, you my, want what to I learn. want to learn. Yes. Okay. Without those basic skills in the class right now, I won't be able to proceed into the university to learn those courses. So what I'm learning right now mm -hmm. is part of my success journey. It's mm -hmm. part of what is going to take me into the university, whereby I'm going to learn that course which I want okay. proper. OK. Mr. Fawaini, uh, you are an educationist, so you will have a lot of information about this, this matter of the curriculum in school and how it helps or how it doesn't help groom students. Question. Um, we, we have a, a government agency responsible for design of curriculum, the NERDC, it's based in Abuja. Uh, the question is that uh, how effective has that institution been? One of the problems that institution has is the speed Mr. of Mr. Bello is shaking his head. <laughs> is, the speed, is, the speed, is the speed of responsiveness to curriculum and changes in the market. One of the biggest problems in Nigeria, when you're talking about curriculum in Nigeria, is the fact that most of the curriculum designers at various levels uh, have... Uh, do not understand the school to market concept. The school to market concept sees this child going through school as somebody being targeted for the market. So, you know, for example, I attended uh, Oshobo Grammar School, I attended University of Ibadan. That school is preparing me for a market. Therefore, that school should rely on the market to determine what I should be trained. But what has happened in Nigeria, for example, is that most schools or most curriculum development organization feel that they are training people for themselves. I used to be a lecturer at a, at a federal university in Ondo State many years ago, and we decided that we're going, to change, we're going to review the curriculum for the estate management department where I was a lecturer. And you know, between the time we started the review till the time it got to Senate, it was well over four years. Now, so the review process was so long that what the market were trying to target had changed. Uh. I mean, so I mean, my, our dear friend in the studio said he likes to be a computer science, a great choice, um, a great a computer scientist, sorry, great choice. But you know what has been found is that based on the principle of the reproduction of knowledge in computer science, research has shown that the knowledge in computer science gets reproduced every six to nine months. What that means, therefore, is that what is in the textbook in computer science today, in six to nine months, the volume of that information will either have been replaced, reproduced, or multiplied by a multiple of two in six to nine months. Mm. So when a child gains admissions to University of Lagos to study computer science, the curriculum he started with, by the time he graduated four years back, the knowledge in the space called computer science will have doubled eight times. But you know the structure of the Nigerian curriculum review system is that curriculum review doesn't even happen every year. So when you're talking okay. about, and that's why, you know, when we talk about all these stories about Jaguar, Nigerians living, you will notice one fact that some trades don't move abroad so quickly. For the trades where the rate of creation of new knowledge is very fast, Nigerians can catch up because it's faster and the other parts of the world are responding. But in some fields where the rate of creation of new knowledge is slower, like medicine, for example, yeah. then we can easily catch up. And that's why a doctor can train from Nigeria and the next day you can plug him to NHS. He can perform immediately. Yeah. So we need to be very conscious of the fact that each sector of the economy, each sector of the market, has a rate of new knowledge creation. Well, and new Ms. knowledge. Mr. Fawwe, it's very interesting. I mean, when you talked about NERDC, I, I knew the office, Lagos office, you know, somewhere in Alausa. Mr. Bilo, please sh stop shaking your head. <laughs> <laughs> because I can understand. I can understand. Well, you know, um, while... As uh, you said the other time, Mr. Fawami, anytime we're talking about children, we think it's just all about education, but it's a lot more than that. And I think uh, the young man here began by talking about the role parents also play. I think I'll shoot this to, um, to Ms. Oluwadari first, and I would like you also, Mr. Fawami, to respond to it a little bit. I showed um, Alera here a little while ago. Um, so I read something in in uh, one of the uh, scriptures um, 
and it's about communication with children. Um, as Alera said when we were starting, when we were all growing up, you don't talk to children, you talk at. You don't talk about children. It's like everything that concerns children is just in one docket. But I found something where, where uh, scriptures say, fathers, don't provoke your children to anger. Um, Ms. Oluwadari, how frequently does that happen today? I'm speaking particularly in the area of how we communicate to children. Do parents provoke their children, or parents are just supposed to do as they are told? OK. Thank you so much for that question. I love that question. Now, communication effectively in the home front is one of the most important things parents should be aware of. The way we communicate with our children goes further than how we think we're trying to drive home our points. Now, that's scripture that says, Father, do not provoke your children to anger really obtains today because today we have children who are carrying so much emotional baggage on their tiny shoulders. These children have been, their personalities have been damaged as a result of the things that their parents have done to them, not only fathers now. Now, the way you speak to a child will determine the lens through which the child will see himself. Mm. If we consistently rub their mistakes on their faces. So a child does something, and just because you want to correct the child, as parents, we think it's okay to reel the child's life history before his face in a flash. You know, we remind him of all the past mistakes. We compare them continuously and all of that. So for the parents, you think you're trying to discipline your child. You think you're correcting your child. You want the child to turn out better but you are actually damaging that child. Because how I speak to you will determine, especially for these children who are still de developing, it will determine how they're going to see themselves. So they have a bad time or a hard time at home in the morning, and then they go out the door, they get to the school, and then something happens. The teacher, who may not fully understand the assignment, continues the same trend that started at home. I mean, how is that child going to feel? Okay. That child is going to feel... We're, we're running out of time, Ms. Oluwadari. Let me ask uh, okay. uh, Mr. Fawemi in a different way. So imagine a child, five years or six years old, comes to you as a father and said, Dad, you are provoking me. <laughs> <laughs> Answer now. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Um, you know, one of the things that we need to be very conscious of is that one of the features of the modern way of teaching a child is to increase their assertiveness. I believe one of the reasons why Nigeria is where it is was that our culture, children are not supposed to be assertive. So we have transferred it. You know, we grew up in a culture where the king is called Kabiosi. I mean, we can't question the king. So that's the culture some of us who are much older grew up in. So now that we have politicians that were elected, we still have that same mindset. So that's why when you ask a question of the governor or the president or the commissioner, people wondering, well, are you not, you should be grateful for what he has done because they still have the mindset of can't be governor, see, you know? Now, when a child walks up to me, when my son says I'm provoking him, the first thing is I need to validate that feeling. He, he, he has, he's feeling something. And the way he can put it in the words is to say, I am provoking him. So the first thing is to first validate the feeling. Oh, okay, I'm provoking you. Or is it, so you feel frustrated by something that I did or said or didn't do. Of course, the guy would like to say yes. Okay, so explain to me what you mean by I'm provoking you. Or what is that feeling you Mr. are Mr. Fawemi, we are out of time. Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. We are out of time. However, I'm just trying to picture a parent right now who was raised in a way. And my child Being says, told, Daddy, yeah. you are provoking me. Huh? Eh? Mr. Bello, you are laughing. Ha. Huh. 30 seconds. OK, I think um, it's more or less evolving parenting, really. Um, many of us grew up 
with the, on a particular stage or generation of life where parents was a whole lot different. Mm. And right now, it is different. So I think, I don't know how, but parents have to be very, very intentional about the way and manner in which they want to um, approach issues regarding their children, rather than just being stereotyped on them. My mother did this way, so it has to be this way. What do you have to say about that? Ten seconds. Um, my, my, own, my own opinion is that um, parents should try to listen to their children. To listen. Um, mm. There are certain ways at which they can present situations huh. to their children. And when they are correcting them, they should try correcting them in love. And when it is time for them to correct them in the harsh manner, they should do that also, but love. try to draw the child back to themselves. Harsh love. We should listen to our children. I think that, so please, you have to listen to me. Okay, my child. Yes, okay. have to right. listen to me. <laughs> I want to thank you all for this morning for being here. Um, thank you. Matthew Okoyemi Olanri Waju, bronze, and win bronze winner, silver participant, international award for young people in Nigeria, and a student, State Senior High School, Alimosho. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you so much. Mr. Oshoke Bello, National Director, International Award for Young People in Nigeria. Thank you so much for your time. Um, Mrs. Sandra Uluwadari, parenting coach and child behavior consultant. We appreciate your time as well as Mr. Yomi Fawemi, HR consultant and educationist. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here this morning. Thank you very much. So in case you just find your child saying, You are provoking me. Daddy, you are provoking me. Don't say, ah. Ah. <laughs> Talondu, we'll Talondu. Right. We'll, we'll be right back. <laughs>International Hospital opened its doors in October 2021. The mission of the hospital is to reverse medical tourism. We take particular care here at the Duchess to bring together a combination of the brightest and the best locally, as well as Nigerians in the diaspora who are interested in returning to do very good work for the benefit of our patients here in this country. The good thing is that we have all international expertise here, all international facilities here, international people working here. Everything is coming together in a space which was considered not great in terms of the availability of healthcare. Access Bank, of course, has been able to provide us with a robust range of products and services that has enabled us to deliver that standard and quality of healthcare that is integral to our mission as an organization. presents hopes, dreams, and challenges. Challenges that can become successes with a little help. Because a little help can empower you to go from despair to celebration. A little help can keep you going until the race is won. Little help can turn bundles of anxiety into a bundle of joy. And with Glow Data, you get much more than just a little help. You get the biggest data deals in town to make everyday glow with small wins and big wins. Dial star triple seven hash to select your Glow Data plan. Lagos. What is that? Eco is Lagos now. It's okay. the only state that has two names. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. They've hmm? said it is Eco, my Lagos. Okay. Why, why is it not just Eco State? <laughs> I, me self uh, attire. Like Ocean State, and Ocean doesn't have English name. Anyway. Or Portuguese name. 
They say that a co my Lagos <laughs> is a social, cultural, and educational program that will be hosted by Doyen School to showcase the beauty of Lagos. It's all about the children again. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very to much. To showcase the beauty of Lagos to our children, our children and yes. the community as a whole. Mm. And give participants a memory of a lifetime which will make them love the state more and be patriotic both to the state and to the nation as they grow up. Those goals you cannot fault. Well, um, a call my Lagos is coming up very soon, and we have two ladies here to tell us more about this program. We have Vicky Omoni, director of Doyen's Nursery and Primary School. Good morning. Good morning. And we also have Essie Ogene Adeniji, head teacher over at the school. Good morning. Good morning. And thank you for coming. Thank you. You are head teacher, so let me start with you. <laughs> Why this program at all? Okay, so for us in Doyen School, we run a thematic program. So for what, we, what do we mean by thematic? It means that so we looked at, we have themes for each session, and then the children work with the theme. So there was a session we talked about seasons, and then we looked at this session and said, what should we talk about? And we're like, oh, let's talk about Eco our Lagos, Eco my Lagos. Because we realized that children really don't know so much about Lagos that they live in, Lagos that they grow up, they are growing up in, Lagos that they school in. Even some adults don't know. Tell me about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we some so that's what, don't even know the meaning of their bus stop. Exactly. So we said to ourselves, we said this school, the director came up with the lovely initiative that let's educate these children. Let them know more about Lagos, mm. the origin, the leaders, the past leaders, what makes us us in Lagos. Okay, M Mrs. Mm -hmm. Amoni, um, this seems to be a very big project. Mm. Yeah. Um, how is it going to look? What's the okay, so she says, we're going to learn about Lagos, our Lagos, fine. Um, are there going to be classes? Yeah. Are there going to be shows? You know, there are going to be films about Lagos? Or how are these children actually going to learn about Lagos? Thank you. Happy Children's Day to all children in Lagos State. Oh, we, thank you, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> I think we should start <laughs> we from should there. Start. Yes. Yeah, and to all children in Nigeria. So Ekoba in Lagos, like we have said, is a social cultural event, an educational event that um, uh, is going to showcase the beauty of Lagos. So it's, we have started already educating the children about the origin, the history, the um, past leaders, Lagos. pioneers, landmark makers of Lagos State. Okay. Right. So they've started learning about all of this since September 2022. So the children have been divided into the five divisions of Lagos, the Ibile. So the, the divisions are there, and the children can tell you what each of those divisions is about. They understand it. They have done different projects. They understand the monuments in Lagos, what those monuments signifies, you know. So they can educate Lagosians about Lagos. So the children are going to be showcasing all of this on the 22nd of June, 2023, precisely. Mm -hmm. They are going to be showcasing it in, in drama, in songs, in poetry, in different presentations and exhibitions. Mm -hmm. So we need everyone in Lagos to be a part of this event, to come watch and be educated about Lagos. We are aiming to give the children an identity mm -hmm. because uh, it is sad when you have children go into the global world and they do not have an identity. Some of them do not know anything about the culture of mm. where they came from, about the culture of where they live in. Mm -hmm. And the people without knowledge of history, origin, and culture is like a tree without yeah. roots. As they are growing, they should have a firm understanding, knowledge, identity of who they are, where they came from, and they should be proud of it. Why, why do you think it's important? I think it's important because there are people who are clueless about themselves. And when you get into a world with that, I mean, into the global world, without having a firm identity of who you are, then you are lost. 
and the anything everywhere looks like road when you don't have an identity, a map. So it is important that they are rooted. It is important that they, they are not shaken. They are not moved by different cultures. You look at the Indians, you look at Chinese, you look at uh, Germans. They are very solid. They hold on to their identity. You can't take it away from them. But unfortunately, in Nigeria, our children are losing it. They don't even know who they are. They don't understand Yoruba. They don't understand Igbo. They don't understand Hausa. They, they, even the English, <laughs> when they still do English tests, they still fail them. They say they don't pa pass our heads. OK, can we just come back to the drawing board and introduce our culture to these children, who we have, and let them be you know, confident, happy with who God has made them. They are black. They are Nigerians. Some of them are Lagosians. Mm. There are people who live in Lagos from birth to death. And they know almost nothing about Lagos, even adults. Okay. You know, so this is what we're trying Thanks. to do to educate both the children and even residents of Lagos as well about Lagos. State. So we are, we are um, customizing it, personalizing it, echo our Lagos, echo my Lagos. But Ms. Adeniji, um, yes, good. Honestly, I, I, I agree. I, I, a friend of mine wrote a book once. I don't know if I told Alera about this. And one of the things that he said was, he did, was to know the origin of the cities, some major areas in Lagos. Apapa, or is it Akpapa? Akpapa. Uh, uh, What's the meaning of this name, oh, Agigi, yes. and all those things? But, um, I that. Energy, mm. the, the, ch the question that I have for you is, sustainability of those things in the hearts and minds of the people. Mm -hmm. Here is why. As soon as they are done learning in school, they've owned it, received it, and everything. The moment they get home, either mommy, auntie, daddy, or uncle yeah. are complaining about Nigeria to them. Mm. How sustainable will... For how long can those children hold on to the ideals that you're teaching them when they have contrary information, so to speak, fed to them at home? Okay, so the beauty about children is they believe so much in their teachers. Have you not heard your first children saying to you, my auntie said this, this is what my auntie said. So we believe because we have so much imparted them now, it might not, like you, you said, it might not last forever, but because they believe so much in us and would keep on emphasizing it at school, they would always say to mom or dad, no, I believe in Nigeria, I believe in Lagos. I believe that something good is coming out of this. I, this is my identity, this is who I want to be. Don't steal it from me. So I believe that it will be sustained. In, in terms mm. of sustainability also, um, is, it, is this an event or a program that is continuous? Oh, okay, so, okay, like I said initially, we run a, run a thematic session. Okay, so because it's for this session, so this session ends in July, and that's why we're having a grand finale in June for okay. this event. So the event ends in June. Okay. But the lessons, but the lessons are, sustained. are sustained. Let me ask the director the same question. Uh, because, as you know, you teachers often tell us that repetition is the helps retention. Retention, thank you. See, teachers. <laughs> repetition helps retention. So, um, is, w what are we looking at in that direction? I know, I mean, it's, it terminates, but then is there a way to at least sustain the remnants of it? in a way that the children will always remember for the duration of time that they are in your school. Okay, so um, I, I understand where you're going. The point is, the children are currently, especially the age of children that we're taking, at their formative age. At the formative age, you can actually instill values and watch it grow. That's why the Bible also talks about train up a child. All right, so even if the home is not doing as much as schools are doing, we will not relent in educating and impacting in, you know, instilling values because have you not learned anything from your child? There are occasions that children actually teach us. They come back home and they're telling you, no, this is what it should be. And they grow up with such strong values. So that is it. And we also run a system where 
we do a lot of parent education. So we are not just in this. Our parents are in it with us. Mm -hmm. They are driving with us. They are ex as, as excited as we are about the event. You know, so like she has said, the event may end in June, but it is not ending because there's a lot of repetition in our curriculum. Even in the school, most of the topics are interlinked. I remember when we took them to the House of Assembly, for instance, the moment they got there, they were able to say a lot about the past leaders that they saw when we got there. They've been to the House of Assembly, they've been to Lagos State Records and Archive Bureau. They, some of them have been to the first um, school Schools. in uh, Lagos State in Nigeria. And they can't, so we have a lot of you know, inter interlinking, we have an interlinking curriculum. So they keep meeting all of this in their learning, in their um, social studies in the school. Okay. Now, um, this event is uh, not a small event. No, it's not. And it has a big budget. As you said, it started in September. Yes, last so, year. Um, so you are going to pull together funds from various angles to put this thing together. And from what I read here, you have a budget of 16.7 million. How are you raising, because I'm sure you have started already, how are you raising that amount of money? Okay, so we wrote, we wrote to the companies seeking for their support. <laughs> Are you laughing? <laughs> yes, because we She's obviously a teacher, not a marketer. <laughs> <laughs> so we okay. What has the response been? Okay, so, um, so it has been positive. We've been getting some responses, and that's why we're here again today. I was saying to Lagosians, we're saying to Nigerians, we're saying to companies, we're saying to the government, we're saying to the governor, we need your support for this, because the children are really excited. If you see what we are wearing, can you show? This is Eco Gris. This is a division, a group, Eco Gris. This is Ikorodu, Badagri, and the island. That's Emiko, that's um, Ekwe, Mainland, and Ikeja. And then this, there's this other group. So the children are really excited. Everybody is coming together. Parents are really supporting us, but we need a larger house. How old are these children we're talking about? By okay, the way? so we have two to 11. 11 yeah. Two to 11. And they are also excited. They are Super rehearsing. Yeah. It's, it, it's just fun. We have WhatsApp group for parents. Parents are, all, parents are almost hijacking it from us, even because they are so, so excited about just it. Imagine. So it we need more exciting. support from our Lagos. Okay. It must be exciting. I can see categories. Yes, of... I was just going to read that out. Oh. Uh, there's platinum category, that's 10 million. Uh, 10 million is the headline sponsor. Then there's the uh, 8 million, the gold. Then there's 5 million for the silver and 3 million for the bronze. And then, of course, all the benefits are listed. So if you are interested, uh, the, the whole list of benefits will be given to you. But uh, I must say that uh, this is a commendable project indeed. Thank you. Because I, I see that, well, Lagos, when I first came to Lagos, Lagos uh, was a much smaller place. Mm. And I knew almost every corner in Lagos. But Lagos has sprawled into various areas now. There are now areas that I, some, some I, I still don't even know. I only read about them in the newspaper. <laughs> Places like Igondo, um, you know, where is that? It's Igondo. Okay, Igondo. Yes. Yes. Igondo. Okay. It's not Ikogri. It's Igondo. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, teacher. Are you? No, no, no. That's the teacher. So I'm Lagos has grown so much. It's now sprawling on all areas. It's grown towards Ibadan. It's grown towards Ekpe. Grown towards Badagri. And before you know what is happening, people are going to be happy with you because you say it's grown towards Ibadan. That means it has overrun Ogun State. Mm -hmm. That was. This is a live Channels Television event. This is Channels Television. Please stay with us as we go live to Abuja, the nation's capital, for the 2023 inauguration lecture, Deepening Democracy for Integration and Development, to be delivered by Kenya's former president, Uhuru Kenyatta. Please stay with us. The president 
the Federal Republic of Nigeria and Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, President Muhammad Buhari. Your Excellency, the former President of the Republic of Kenya, President Uhuru Kenyatta. Your Excellency, the Vice President-elect, the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Kashim Shetima, GCON, the Deputy Speaker of the House of Representatives, members of the Federal Executive Council here present, the National Chairman of the All Progressive Congress and all members of the Executive Committee, your Royal Highness, the Sultan of Sokoto, who is a contributor at this inauguration lecture, the Catholic Bishop of Sokoto, Bishop Matthew Kuka, the President of the African Development Bank, Dr. Akinwumi Adeshina, and the youth leader of the APC, permanent secretaries, royal highnesses, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and gentlemen of the press. It is with great honor and privilege that I stand before you today on this momentous occasion of the 2023 presidential inauguration lecture with the theme, Deepening Democracy for Development. In my capacity as the Chairman of the Presidential Transition Council, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome every one of you to this auspicious event. First and foremost, I would like to commend President Muhammad Buhari for his unwavering dedication to strengthening democracy in Nigeria. Throughout his tenure, he has consistently emphasized the importance of democratic principles, the rule of law, and good governance. His commitment to upholding the integrity of electoral processes, enhancing transparency, and combating corruption has been commendable. Likewise, his efforts towards ensuring the active participation of citizens in decision-making. In like manner, I welcome His Excellency, the Vice President-elect, Kashim Shatima, GCON, for gracing this occasion with his esteemed presence. His leadership and dedication and unwavering commitment to the progress of our nation have been an inspiration to all. Furthermore, I extend a warm welcome to His Excellency, President Uhuru Kenyatta, President, former President of the, Federal, of the Republic of Kenya, who has graced us with his profound insights in previous occasions, and I think he will do similarly today. Your wealth of experience, Your Excellency, in governance, regional integration, and social economic transformation is highly esteemed. And we eagerly await the wisdom and knowledge you would impart upon us. Undeniably, Nigeria has experienced deep divisions and polarizations exacerbated by politics, poverty, and illiteracy. Political, ethnic, religious, and other fault lines have strained the fabric of our society, threatening the very essence of our unity. We acknowledge the damaging influence of hate news Disinformation and the propagation of divisive narratives 
which have sown seeds of discord and hindered our social or political development. In the light of these pressing concerns, the theme of this inauguration lecture, Deepening Democracy for Development, assumes paramount significance. It is our firm belief that by embracing this team, we can transcend the existing fault lines and foster a renewed sense of common purpose, understanding, and shared responsibility among Nigerians. The profound significance of this lecture lies in its power to illuminate the path we must continue to traverse as a nation, deepen our democratic values, and unlock the full potential of our developmental aspirations. It is an occasion that calls for introspection, evaluation, and concerted efforts to strengthen our democratic institutions, practices, and processes. This gathering represents the essence of our collective aspirations as we come together to discuss and reflect upon the path we have traversed and the road that lies ahead. The 2023 presidential inauguration lecture serves as a platform for dialogue and enlightenment and the sharing of ideas, all aimed at fostering the growth and development of our beloved nation. Today's program of events encompasses a wide array of topics that are pivotal to the progress and unity of our nation from deepening democracy for development and integration to religious tolerance, economic growth, security, and youth inclusiveness. We have deliberately chosen these themes to provoke thoughtful conversations and generate actionable solutions. Through robust discussions and engagement, we hope to foster a collective vision for a better Nigeria. We are therefore honored to have in our midst an illustrious lineup of speakers, each a visionary in their respective fields, who have graciously accepted our invitation to share their wisdom and insight. As I mentioned earlier, we are privileged to have the former President of Kenya, His Excellency Uhuru Kenyatta, as our keynote speaker, who brings with him a wealth of experience and a profound understanding of the complex dynamics between democracy and development. We are equally delighted to have the esteemed Sultan of Sokoto, His Eminence, Muhammad Saad Abubakar III, CFR, MNI, and the Most Reverend Bishop Matthew Hassan Kuka, the Bishop of the Catholic Diocese of Sokoto, who will enlighten us on the crucial topics of religious tolerance and inclusiveness. Their words will serve as beacons of light, guiding us towards uniting a harmonious society where all Nigerians can coexist peacefully, regardless of their religious affiliations. Furthermore, we are honored to have Dr. Akim Wumi Adeshina, COL, the President of the African Development Bank, who will share his invaluable insights on further strengthening of our economy during the Tunibu years. His expertise and guidance would undoubtedly foster or steer us toward enhanced sustainable economic growth and prosperity. We are also privileged to have Ms. Amina Mohammed, GCON, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, who through a recorded message will be sharing her deep understanding of the intersectionality between security and development. She will shed light on the path to achieving a secured and prosperous Nigeria. And finally, we have the youthful and esteemed Dio Israel, the national youth leader of the All Progressive Congress, who will emphasize the critical importance of youth inclusiveness in governance. His perspective 
will remind us of the immense potential that lies within our vibrant youth population and the need to improve them or empower them as catalysts for positive change. In conclusion, let us approach this inauguration lecture with open hearts and open minds, ready to embrace the wisdom shared by our esteemed speakers. May their insight ignite our imaginations, challenge our perspectives, and spur us to take bold and decisive actions that deepen our democracy and accelerate our journey towards sustainable development. May this inauguration lecture be the catalyst that propels us towards the Nigeria we continually envision, a Nigeria that thrives on democracy, embraces inclusivity, and realizes the aspiration of his people. Thank you once again. Welcome, and God bless the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Boss Mustafa. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, in 1999, Nigeria took a decisive step to return to democratic governance. 24 years down the line, the country is undergoing its seventh consecutive transition from one civilian administration to another. That, Your Excellencies, provides the platform for today's lecture, Deepening Democracy for Development and Integration. Let me take just a moment to tell you a bit about the keynote speaker. His Excellency Uhuru Kenyatta, CGH, is the fourth president of the Republic of Kenya. He served as president for two terms between 2013 and 2022. He had previously served as a member of parliament, leader of the opposition, minister for local government, deputy prime minister, and minister of finance. Former President Kenyatta's presidency was underpinned by a commitment to economic and social transformation, national unity, good governance, regional integration, and intra-Africa trade. Under President Kenyatta's leadership, Kenya consolidated its position as a leader in climate change, the blue economy, and digital technologies that emerged Nairobi as a regional hub for major international organizations and corporations. In addition, from 2021 to 2023, Kenya served a two-year term as a non-permanent member of the United Nations Security Council. Following the promulgation of a new constitution in 2010, His Excellency Kenyatta presided over the rolling out of an ambitious program to restructure the Kenyan state involving large-scale political, fiscal, and administrative decentralization. During his last term, His Excellency Kenyatta was chair of the African Union Peace and Security Council and the Summit of East Africa Community Heads of State. In addition, he was the chair of the African Leaders Malaria Alliance, a coalition of African Union heads of state and government to drive accountability and action for results against malaria. He also served as the president in office of the Organization of the African, Caribbean, and Pacific States, comprising 79 African, Caribbean, and Pacific states. In addition, he is still serving as a member of the high-level panel for Sustainable Ocean Economy, a unique initiative of 14 serving world leaders to build momentum towards a sustainable ocean economy. While still in power, His Excellency Kenyatta served as a global leader for the Young People's Agenda under the UN-led Generation Unlimited Initiative, GenU, which seeks to ensure that by 2030, all young persons aged 10 to 24 are in school, training, or employment. In July 2022, before his retirement from the presidency, the former president was endorsed as global champion for Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program 
by world leaders. All the regional level and at the regional level, former President Kenyatta championed regional integration, intra-Africa trade, and a more vital role of the African continent on the global stage. In addition, he was at the forefront of promoting peace and security efforts in the region. Following his retirement from presidency in August 2022, His Excellency Kenyatta was appointed as the East Africa Community Facilitator of the Nairobi Process Inter-Congolese Consultations aimed at restoring peace, security, and stability in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo. The former president also serves as a special envoy for the Horn of Africa and Great Lakes region alongside three other mediators appointed to spearhead the Ethiopia Tigray AU led peace talks. Your Excellency, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me at this point humbly invite His Excellency Uhuru Kenyatta, CGA, the keynote speaker at today's inauguration lecture, to now deliver his lecture. Your Excellency. Your Excellency Muhammadu Buhari, President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, Your Excellency Vice President-Elect Senator Kashim Shetima, all elected leaders here present, your Eminence's traditional leaders here present, leaders of our different faiths here present, Your Excellency members of the Diplomatic Corps, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Let me begin by saying a good morning to all of you, and at the very onset, to take this opportunity to thank you, President Buhari, and your entire team for inviting me to Abuja for the second time in under a year to engage together with you in meaningful discourse with leaders of Nigeria. I must, at a personal level, however, confess my great affinity to a man who I consider to be one of my closest colleagues when I was in government, but also a wise and sober father figure in the name of President Buhari. Indeed, as a son who retired before the father, I look forward to welcoming you to the very exclusive club of former African presidents, a club <laughs> that remains exclusive because it only admits members who have willingly retired from office. Indeed, it is a great honor and privilege for me to join you all this morning on a weekend when the country is preparing itself to witness its seventh consecutive civilian leadership transition. Your Excellencies, this is not a moment to be taken for granted. And to this end, I must take this opportunity to extend my most heartfelt and sincere congratulations to the people of Nigeria for choosing yet again to walk the more difficult path, to look past the challenges of a difficult election, and to embrace the learnings that come 
from a maturing democracy. In every high stakes contest, there will always be those who emerge victors and also those who will end up being losers. What has set Nigeria apart from many nations on our continent today is that its leaders have chosen to disappoint the naysayers and the prophets of doom and have opted instead to express their political differences within the framework of a constitutional order. <clears throat> this is not an easy thing to do when there are many other ways and means to express dissatisfaction, methods that could easily trigger civil unrest, lead to loss of life, and cause irreparable harm to your nationhood. In the unlikely event that no one has mentioned it to you, let me say it today that Nigeria is a country blessed with a generation of great need leaders, both inside and outside of the government, be they in Aso Rock, in Lagos, or Anambra, I salute you all for steering the nation peacefully up to this milestone moment. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I was invited here to speak on the topic of deepening democracy for development, a subject that remains close to my heart, and it is my hope that you shall permit me to speak freely and to say things as they are so that you can glean the most from my own experiences and observations as a former head of state. Experiences that not only celebrate success, but that equally acknowledges challenges. And I want to speak to you not as a Kenyan speaking to Nigerians, but as one African speaking to fellow Africans. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the last set of African nations to attain self-rule and independence from the shackles of colonialism and apartheid was 33 years ago in 1990 when Nelson Mandela and Sam Nyoma took the reins of their respective countries. One would have expected that three decades on from the departure of those who had oppressed, discriminated, and exploited our people for centuries, that our continent, Africa, would find herself to be not only more prosperous, but socially and economically stable. That we would have harnessed our immense God-given mineral wealth, our agricultural potential, and our abundant human capital to propel the well-being of our citizens and to strengthen our voice in the global community of nations. It is sad to note that today, many thousands of our children are migrating to Europe on fishing boats, fleeing from chaos and poverty, and braving harrowing dangers in search of a so-called better life. Over the last five decades, more than half the countries in Africa have experienced some form of armed conflict. African states have either been at war with each other or at war with themselves. Today, as I stand before you, there are at least 15 active theaters of non-international armed conflict on our continent, with a few more tittering on the brink. But we must go back and ask ourselves, why are we here? We must remember that when our borders were carved up 
in European boardrooms in the late 1880s, our societies were torn apart by boundaries that do not reflect how we would have chosen to organize ourselves. Traditional kingdoms were split or destroyed in their entirety. Those who shared common languages and other fraternal bonds found themselves on different sides of arbitrary borders. And in some cases, the colonialists imposed one community to superintend over others as part of their divide and rule strategy that would allow them to govern indirectly. In very few parts of Africa was any border drawn to accommodate religious and ethnic homogeny. As a consequence, we found ourselves inside countries that were somewhat a mixed bag. But I believe, as some would say, that you deal and live with what you're dealt with and make the most of it. Why do I say so? I say so because these differences in and of themselves are not fatal. They only become toxic if we as a people let them. We must start to see strength in our diversity if we are really serious about assuming our rightful place in this world as Africans. And why do I mention this? Because it is important to understand the genesis of most of these conflicts and what impact they have on our development trajectory as a continent. We must strive to identify the natural fissure lines existing within our societies that make it so easy for conflict to thrive and for democracy to be undermined. Against this backdrop, we can drill down to what I feel and believe are the three fundamental issues that are so easily weaponized to the detriment of our democratic growth. The first of these is negative ethnicity or tribalism, followed by religion, and lastly, economic greed. When you look deeply at the crux of most of our conflicts within our continent, we are either fighting for ethnic or sub-ethnic superiority of one community at the expense of others, or we are propagating divisive narratives that have their origins in religious differences or sectarianism. As we sit here today, we know for a fact that some of these elements I have mentioned remain a clear and present danger for the future of Nigeria. The incoming administration has a unique opportunity to use this inflection point brought about by a peaceful and orderly transition to take stock of what sort of future it wants for the people of this country and for the future of this nation. Will Nigeria continue fighting for its place on the world stage with one hand tied behind its back or will it use this moment in time to embrace a brave new way of doing things and thereby unleashing the full might of this green giant? 
As you ponder on that thought, allow me to take you back to a time in 2013 when I was first elected into office. At that time, I was facing the most serious challenge of my life, both as an individual and in my capacity as president. I was facing a trial at The Hague for alleged crimes against humanity, charges that were later proven to be unfounded. As I went on to settle into State House, I found myself introspecting more and more as to how I ended up in this unenviable position and what were the deeper issues and what these could be. I summarized at the time that it was an unfortunate side effect of the deeply contested 2007 elections that led to widespread inter-ethnic violence causing the loss of some 1,300 lives and the displacement of over 600,000 Kenyans from their homes. At the center of this violence was fighting between the tribes or ethnic communities ostensibly associated with the leading political actors of the day. My predecessor and the third president of Kenya, His Excellency the late Mwai Kibaki, the leader of the opposition at the time, the Honorable Raila Odinga, my successor and the fifth president of Kenya, William Ruto, and of course yours truly myself, as the party leader of the then Kenya African National Union and a supporter of the incumbent President Mwai Kibaki. What started off as an election dispute over results between political parties very quickly escalated into a full-scale conflict between different ethnic communities whose perceived historical differences were easy powder kegs to ignite. How did we get to this low point? Whereas what happened in 2007 was unprecedented in its scale and ferocity, election-related violence was not a new phenomenon in Kenya per se. We had seen some different manifestations of ethnic-based electoral violence from the early 1990s with the reintroduction of multi-party democracy. However, nothing was like what we were to witness in 2007 and 2008. With a country of 43 distinct ethnic communities having been led exclusively by two tribes from independence, we had always found a way to gloss over the issues of negative ethnicity, hoping that by ignoring the issue, it would somehow sort itself out. Nothing could have been further from the truth. In fact, in the year 2002, after what many say was Kenya's first truly democratic multi-party elections, a new government was ushered in that raised the expectation of the citizenry. Hopes were high that equitable development, economic uplift would impact the lives of every Kenyan without discrimination. During this brief honeymoon phase, The country's economy boomed, with Kenya posting a real GDP growth rate of 6.9% at the close of 2007. However, trouble was brewing 
and the coalition in power started to strain at the seams. The feeling that electoral promises on the distribution of political power among different communities were not being honored all came to the fore. The differences came out in the open when the first attempt was made at, at the constitutional referendum in 2005, the government-sponsored referendum bill was resoundingly rejected by we who were in the opposition, and unfortunately the stage set for a monumental fight in the run-up to the 2007 election. When the election came round, it seemed that the perfect trifecta had formed. The inequalities in development became more and more difficult to ignore. The feelings of some communities that they had been excluded from the national agenda or outrightly subjugated by the government of the day was palpable. All that was needed to ignite the, situ the situation was a closely contested election. And when that came, the tinderbox was lit. The rest, as we say, is history, and unfortunately the start of one of the darkest moments in Kenya's independent era. When the dust had settled, Kenya thereafter was to experience its most profound constitutional moment yet. The fear of a return to violence created the much needed environment for constitutional reforms that would transform the system of governance from that of a powerful central government to that of a devolved system of governance. The premise of the reforms was to find a way to guarantee equitable distribution of development across the entire country as a matter of right and not by dint of any political privilege. <coughs> I am grateful to God for allowing me the opportunity to be the first president to implement Kenya's 2010 new constitution. However, that said, the years following the passage of this historic new constitution, the underlying issues around ethnic inclusion at the national level did not fade away. And the situation once again came to a head in 2017, almost 10 years to the month after the post-election violence of 2007. I, as head of state and government, was determined not to let history repeat itself. I had spent the last, the, the last two years of my first term trying to make up for the lost time that had been wasted running back and forth from The Hague. My administration was therefore working double time to try and fulfill our election pledges and to allow us the option to seek a fresh mandate in 2017. The 2017 election proved to be yet another milestone moment in my political life. For the first time in Kenya's history, the outcome of a general election had been overturned by the courts. Whether on account of judicial activism or plain ignorance, the decision of the Supreme Court to overturn my August victory and order fresh elections was all that was needed to put the country on an extremely dangerous footing. The constitutional lacuna surrounding the lack of defined and codified rules of engagement for the operations of government in the event of such a repeat election exasperated the situation even further. 
as the country prepared to go back to the polls for a second time on October 26, 2017, the main opposition parties made the decision to boycott the polls and whereas the victory of my party was all but assured, the victory came at a price. Once again, two communities had gotten their way yet again, and the much touted tyranny of numbers had delivered another victory with staggering efficiency. Indeed, the intelligence reports in the days and weeks after the election and my subsequent inauguration pointed towards growing intercommunal and inter-ethnic unrest, more so in some hotspots, particularly in the mass urban settlements of Nairobi and in our lakeside region of our country. Our security services adopted a containment posture and did their best in, pre in preventing the situation from escalating. And as I was getting my daily updates, I was reassured that normalcy would be restored, and indeed it was. However, ladies and gentlemen, as it has been said by leaders across the world, peace is not informed purely by the absence of conflict. By the time Christmas of 2017 was approaching, it became clear to me that the calm that had returned to the country had been replaced by an inexplicable sadness and a tangible despondency that had seeped into the hearts and minds of large sections of our population. There were communities that felt defeated, that they had nothing more to lose, and that they no longer wanted to associate with a country known as Kenya because they felt that they had no stake in it. I was not the only one who sensed that there was more that bellied this uneasy calm and that something serious and possibly more sinister was slowly brewing. The economy had not bounced back at the pace we had anticipated. Investors had adopted a wait and see attitude and even though my coalition had an overwhelming majority in both houses of parliament, the politics seemed to be all wrong. And all this happening at a time when I was reconstituting my cabinet, putting in place the organization needed to deliver on the remainder of our pledges to the people of Kenya. And it was then that I was reminded about the inverse co correlation between our election cycles and the country's economic performance. Whenever political temperatures went up, real GDP growth came down. The facts do not lie. In 1992, after the first multi-party elections, since the lifting of the ban on political pluralism, real GDP growth contracted to 0.8% from 1.4% the previous year. In 1997, it dropped to 0.4% down from the previous 4.5%. The same thing happened in 2008 when the economy virtually ground to a standstill. The long and short of it was that after every election from 1992, our country would take a hit for up to two years. Things would then settle, and shortly thereafter, we would be once again in campaign mood, and the vicious cycle would readily repeat itself. This meant that during every election cycle, thousands of jobs were lost, private investment and private sector confidence would shrink, and revenues to government would be strained, with adverse effects 
on our national development agenda. And it was then that I made possibly one of the most difficult decisions of my pre presidency. And I resolved two things. Firstly, that I would deliver on my development promise no matter what. And secondly, that I would not be the president that took Kenya back into any form of civil strife. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it was not weakness that led me to seek out the leader of the opposition at the time, the Right Honorable Raila Odinga. It was the appreciation that it was not about him, but rather the people whom he represented. <clears throat> the millions who felt excluded and marginalized by our brand of politics and the imperfections of our democracy. The things that we discussed in the days that followed and which culminated on the 9th of March 2018 in what we Kenyans commonly refer to as a handshake are the subject of another lecture. Suffice it to say that on that day, our country, Kenya, exhaled a breath of fresh air and freedom. <clears throat> the dialogue that began was about what we needed to do to make Kenyans feel included in the affairs of their nation. It was about how we could strengthen devolution to deliver on what the framers of our constitution had intended. It was about how to make every Kenyan from large or small communities feel like the government was theirs. We recognize that when stripped down to its most rudimentary form, Kenya was simply an amalgamation of different ethnic communities trying to coexist peacefully within the borders that we found ourselves in. We recognize that for Kenya to endure as an indivisible nation, a winner-takes-all situation was not sustainable over the long term, and that the structures and organization of government would need to rethink to accommodate the realities of who we really were deep down. We concluded that ethnic big bigotry was a convenient cover for the vice of corruption, because it was always easy to say that it was our turn to eat, and whatever we were doing, we were doing for the sake of our people. <clears throat> Even as the country sighed in relief after the handshake, the weight did not lift from my shoulders, for I now had the arduous task of taking and carrying along with me on this journey those who had benefited from the previous status quo. That, my dear friends, was easier said than done. Many of those from my political strongholds could not comprehend why any political concessions needed to be made to those from other political parties, more so because many of the proposals meant that the tyranny of numbers wielded by the larger communities would no longer be an assured path to absolute power. They would have to contend with a seat at a much bigger table alongside many more people. The hardliners in my camp would remain skeptical and would take any bump along the way as an excuse to tell me to initiate a course correction. I would ask them, where do you want us to go? Do you want our brothers and sisters back on the streets? 
Do we want to go back to tear gas and rubber bullets to be our only tools of persuasion? This I flatly rejected, and I said, and I took pleasure thereafter in reading intelligence reports that talked about other issues and not simmering ethnic tension. Contrary to the general expectation of the time, I did not dissolve government. I did not initiate the formation of a government of national unity. Both Raila and I knew that the issues we were discussing were too deeply rooted in our people's psyche to be resolved by some simplistic com cosmetic touch-ups. Touch After all, as they say, a pig with lipstick is still a pig. To some on both sides of the divide, the handshake was an inconvenient occurrence in the succession arithmetic. However, for me, it was the beginning of righting many wrongs that had been committed since our independence. Wrongs that had led to lopsided development and a concentration of power, wealth, and opportunity in the hands of a few at the expense of the development of many. I can see my brother here is also concerned about my development. Thank you very much. Uh, My decision to pursue an agenda of inclusivity bore fruits in many ways. In the period from 2018 up to 2022, Kenya recorded some of its fastest development gains. It was the togetherness of the, of the Kenyan people that allowed my administration to steer the country through the difficulties of COVID-19 that ravaged both lives and livelihoods. It was the unity of purpose that allowed Kenya to play its rightful role in the international stage by securing a non-permanent seat at the UN Security Council and playing host to a multitude of international events. In 2022, it was this unity and sense of inclusion that allowed us to experience one of Kenya's most peaceful general elections while closing the year strong economically at a real GDP rate, growth rate of 4.8%. On the 6th of September, 2022, I handed over the reins of leadership to my successor, President William Ruto, in a colorful and peaceful ceremony. It was a proud moment for me and for Kenya. No matter what was felt about the outcome of the elections, we stayed true to our constitution. Although I completed my term in office, having not realized to my full satisfaction the agenda of de-risking Kenya's governance structures for the benefit of future generations, I remain committed to the cause because I feel that when we embrace inclusion, consultation, and consensus building in our politics, it only serves to improve the lives of our citizens. It is said that a day in politics is a very long time, and that politics remains the art of the possible. As I today settle into my retirement and shift my focus, time, and energy towards the peaceful resolution of conflicts on our continent, I remain alive to the fact that I must continue to play a part in fostering peace in my home country of Kenya. I use my voice and my platform to persuade, especially those in power, that a dialogue with those in opposition to their victory is not a weakness, nor is it a denial of their victory, but rather, a much needed tool that creates a more inclusive Kenya and that sets a forward developmental trajectory.
a trajectory that meets the expectations of all in our society. And I remind that the mentality of winner takes it all can only result in division and retardation of our national development agenda. Therefore, dear friends, as you celebrate victory of an election and prepare to inaugurate a new president, remember that your victory is not just about numbers, as Western democracies would have us believe, but that the real victory will be how you will reach out to all the voices in Nigeria and how every Nigerian, from Katsina in the north to Port Harcourt in the south, from Bambana in the west to Maiduguri in the east, how they will all feel included in your victory and see and see your government as their government, your agenda as their agenda, one Nigeria, one government for all. And if I may address His Excellency the President-elect, President Tinubu, through you, Your Excellency Vice President-elect, I speak to you as a brother, but also as an elder statesman in leadership. The contest is now over, and the hard work of building a prosperous and unified Nigeria now begins. <laughs> Upon assuming the office of president, you would be wise to transcend from the tactical politics of an election and assume your role as Nigeria's vision bearer. This will demand a complete overhaul of the adversarial mindset that we as politicians are conditioned to embrace during the electoral process. As president, you must learn very quickly to lead those who love you and those who loathe you with equal passion and commitment because you are now the father of all. Your Excellency, when countries are in election mode, the people and its leaders are more divided than ever and boxed into their various sectarian and partisan interests. However, when you are the head of state and you take command of the country's armed forces, you become the embodiment of the sum total of the many different ethnic groups, religions that make up your country and you become the symbol of unity, indeed, you become the face of Nigeria. I encourage you to surround yourself with the voices of those who will counterbalance the hardliners that feel entitled to a piece of your office. You will lose nothing and gain everything by reaching out across the political, ethnic, and religious lines to those who may feel aggrieved by your victory in one way or another, please allow them to exhale and be part of your vision for a greater Nigeria. It is my hope and my prayer but the lessons from across the continent will give you the resolve to walk the difficult path of overcoming those three enemies I started by I mentioning the three enemies of nationhood. Negative ethnicity, religious discrimination, 
and corruption. As your fellow African, I look forward to a Nigeria that emerges from this transition ready to flex and fight for its rightful place on the global stage with both hands at the ready. Your Excellency, President Buhari, I once again thank you for your leadership. I thank you for your friendship. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all very kindly for your attention. May God bless you all. May God bless the Federal Republic of Nigeria and her people. And may God bless Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It is about the people we represent, deploying clarity, erudition, great elocution with thought-provoking nuggets. His Excellency President Uhuru Kenyatta, the presidential inauguration keynote speaker, has defined what it means to be a speaker of note. We thank him. We thank him for bringing his cerebral nature, challenge of multi-party, his experience, issues of governance, conflict resolution, power of inclusion, the issue of vision bearing, and what needs to be brought to the table, analytical and incisive. A truly worthy speaker, a respected statesman. We thank you, Your Excellency, Asante Sana, Thank you so very much indeed. It's time now to bring forward speakers who will bring different perspectives. And it's time to invite Mr. Cyril Stover to do the honor. Cyril. Thank you, Eugenia. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. In a moment, we'll be listening to a contribution titled Religious Tolerance and Inclusiveness. Let me take a moment to talk about the contributor. His Eminence, Muhammad Saad Abu Bakr, CFR MNI, is the 20th Sultan of Sokwatu and President General of the Nigerian Supreme Council for Islamic Affairs ascending the throne of his forebears some 17 years ago. Now, this foremost traditional ruler was a career military officer and rose to the rank of a one-star general before answering the call to mount the exalted throne of both the head of the Sokoto Caliphate and spiritual head of Muslims in Nigeria. He served as defense attache of the Nigerian High Commission to Pakistan with concurrent accreditation to Iraq the Gulf States, and Saudi Arabia. His clear display of intense patriotism and passion for Nigeria's development saw him attending the senior executive calls at the National Institute of Policy and Strategic Studies, Kuru, in 2006. Presently, he serves as co-chair of the Nigeria Interreligious Council, a body established to provide religious and traditional leaders with a platform to contribute to national cohesion and promote greater interaction, as well as better understanding among the leaders and their followers in the country. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, may I now respectfully invite His Eminence, Muhammad Saad Abu Bakr III, CFR, Sultan of Sokoto, to deliver his station. Your Eminence. I will be lying in the shirt on the regime. 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على النبي الكريم يا اكسلنسي the president commander in chief of the armed forces president muhammad buhari gcfr who is living in a couple of hours on a very very high note and much 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 healthier and looking much much fresher despite all the odds and the tension the vice president elect Hashim Shatima GCON our own dear very very dear brother the former president of Kenya Uhuru Kenyatta whose last sentences or words were those of a very very patriotic Nigerian we thank you for your comments and we believe those who have ears must have heard you very very clearly i must recognize my core contributors to this inaugural lecture and of course the owner of ife my own very dear brother the co-chairman of the national council of traditional rulers and other distinguished leaders of this our great country I greet you all in the best form of greeting. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We've just had a very, very interesting topic given to us by highly experienced and respected elder statesmen in our great continent, Africa and the world. When you are called to speak after such a very eloquent lecture telling us what his experiences have been and are still going on in his dear country and Africa. And given the topic to speak on religious tolerance and inclusiveness, and also knowing and taking note <clears throat> that yesterday at the National Mosque, we had a lecture which captured all the ingredients or most of the ingredients of religious tolerance and inclusiveness. I believe I shouldn't be saying much on that religious tolerance. Tolerance is what we have been working on the last 16 years as co-chairman of NAREC, together with the president of Khan, and I believe the SGF in the last five, six, seven years have been the anchor and the arrowhead of our activities, so he knows a lot and the government too knows a lot about our works for religious tolerance and understanding in this great country, Nigeria. So I will debate a little bit, but not too off because most of the things I'm going to say, if you put them together with what the former president of Kenya said, you'll find a lot of similarities. So I crave your indulgence to patiently listen in the next eight, nine, 10 minutes of my president, even though I was given 15 minutes. We all know why we have democracy. And we call democracy a government of the people, by the people, for the people. And such democracy we are supposed to practice or to have is to ensure development, peace and stability of our people. And without development, without peace and stability, there's no democracy. And you can't have democracy when you don't have good leaders to practice that democracy. So leadership is of utmost importance. If you want to really practice democracy, move the country forward to the greatest height. So I'll briefly talk about some of the things that I'm so very familiar with, what leadership is all about, because there's need for us look at what we should do. I'll skip a lot of uh, sentences or comments that people might not understand. But I want to start by expressing our deep gratitude to Almighty Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, the Most High, 
for making it possible to witness the seventh consecutive democratic transition of power in our great country, Nigeria, without any major hitch or crisis. This in itself is a significant achievement in which both the winners and those who did not win, I don't call them losers, those who won and those who did not win share in the credit. The lecture from our distinguished speaker has been well conceived and delivered, and I believe we've all heard it. Our task here is to see how we can enrich the conversation by broadening the perspectives and propounding advice to the incoming administration of, this, of our great country on ways to improve on governance and development in an atmosphere of peace and security. Coming from a tradition of good governance that is informed by an intellectual tradition, which itself is an heir of a long tradition of governance going back to the empires of Ghana, Mali, and Songhai, perhaps my contribution should dwell on the writings of our forefathers who established the Sokta Caliphate over 200 years ago. Being scholars, these leaders have left behind over 350 different works between the three prominent figures. I will just provide some few snipp snippets to take us through this short presentation. On the necessity of government, for example, Sultan Muhammad Bello said, it is certainly known that if it were not for the power of rulers, no person would have been safe in his house, let alone in the wilderness. Nor would it be permissible for any person to collect tax and the interest of the public will not have been preserved. For this reason, it becomes necessary to appoint a supreme leader and his deputies, such as the prime ministers, the governors, and the judges of all the regions of the earth, so that the interest of religion and leadership may be maintained and the proper order of the entire world be established. If it were not for the authority of state, many people would have been killed before they could kill a single man who is legally condemned to death when they seek to obtain their rights from each other without a force to protect them. Rulers in our case are those who have been elected to govern us, govern our country, our states at both the federal and state levels should see leadership as a trust from God for which they have to ultimate, ultimately account to him as Sheikh Abdullah bin Fodio said. Verily, political power is a vagrancy from Allah and a stewardship from God's apostle. How great then its dignity and how heavy are its burdens. If the leader follows the path of righteousness, piety will take ascendancy over his worldly desires. If he goes astray, his piety will fall victim to worldly lust. Therefore, fear God. Know that every soul shall have a test of death, and you shall receive your full recompense on the day of judgment. Leadership is also a service to the people. As Sheikh Uthman Amfodio said, seeing to the welfare of people is more effective than the use of force. It has been said that the crown of a leader is his integrity, his stronghold is his impartiality, and his wealth is that of his people of his people. There will be no triumph with transgression, no rule without learning, and no leadership with vengeance. No society can rise above its leaders. In other words, 
It is the quality of leaders which determines and pets the quality of society. As Dr. Muhammad Bello said, leaders are like a spring of water, and all our officials are like water wheels. If the spring is pure, the fields in the water wheels cannot harm it. If, on the other hand, the spring is polluted and dirty, the purity of the water wheels that we use to draw the water will have little or no effect on the purity of the water. Leaders still need to be very careful in the appointment of officials. And Sheikh Osman bin Fodio said, the first support is on upright wazir, that is a prime minister or a deputy over the state. Who, can, who wakes him, the leader, who wakes him up if he sleeps? Give him sight if he cannot see. And remind him if he forgets. The greatest catastrophe which can befall le leaders and people is to be deprived of good wazirs or ministers and good assistances. The most important qualifying attitude or attribute of the leader of the wazir is to be of trustworthy conduct, perceptive in the affairs of the common people, the courage to tell the truth, and must not withhold good advice from the leader. Mohammed Bello has a piece of advice to these officials in his Usul Sias, in one of his very famous books, where he wrote, the happiest leader is he whose subjects are happy with him, and the most unfortunate leader is he whose subjects are miserable under him. So beware of injustice, for your workers are imitating you. If you commit injustice, you will be like the animal in a green pasture, which eats so much that it becomes so fat, and that fatness is the cause of its destruction, as it will be slaughtered and eaten." Unquote. Leaders need to understand those things that are necessary for a state to survive, and those that are capable of destroying qualities. On this, Sheikh Othman Danfodio wrote, one of the swiftest ways of destroying a state is to give preference to one particular tribe over another, or to show favor to one group of people over the other, and, if, and draw near those who should be kept away, and keep away those who should be draw, drawn near you. A ruler was asked when he had lost his throne, what brought, you, what you have, what brought your rule to an end? He replied, being intransigent in my views and neglecting to seek advice. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, these are some of the few remarks I want to make to draw attention of our incoming governors, uh, presidents, and other leaders on the intellectual heritage, which we have been talking about for decades, or for centuries, rather, which I hope our elected officials will reflect on and find useful as they undertake the onerous task of children with the affairs of the state. I should also draw your attention to levels of poverty and ignorance in the land, and ignorance in the land only made worse by the rising population of this country, which is estimated by the United Nations to be well over 400 million by 2050, which will make Nigeria the third largest populated country in the world after India and China. As political leaders, you need not only think of the next election, but also, and more importantly, think of the next generation. I leave you with these thoughts and pray for God's guidance, wisdom, and patience for our leaders to take our country 
to the highest height. And may we have peace and stability in our great country, Nigeria. And as we wish our incoming government most, most of the Allah's blessings in all what they do to take our country to the promised land, we call on all and all to give support, prayer, and stay in peace. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward all of our leaders for, for what they have done for our country. And may He bring peace and stability. As I also leave you in peace, I say, Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. His Eminence, Mohammed Sa'ad Abu Bakr III, CFR, Sultan of Sokotur, speaking there. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, now with a different perspective on the same topic, religious tolerance and inclusiveness, is the contribution of Bishop Matthew Hassan Kuka, a religious cleric of repute an author of distinction, an irrepressible social critic, and an unrepentant advocate of social justice, equity, and a better society at home and worldwide. Matthew Hassan Kuka served as a member of Nigeria's Truth Commission, secretary of the Catholic Bishops' Conference, member of Nigeria Electoral Reform Committee, and also a member of the National Peace Committee. A Kennedy School of Government master's degree holder in public policy. He also holds a Doctor of Philosophy degree from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. Matthew Hassan Kuka is currently the Catholic Bishop of Sokwato Diocese. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, may I invite my Lord Bishop Matthew Hassan Kuka. Your Excellencies, Mr. President and the Vice President and uh, our brother, friend, the former President of uh, Kenya, other distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure that many of you may already be nervous as to what Bishop Kuka is going to say. <laughs> I feel like Miriam Makeba, the late Miriam Makeba. She said that every time I stand up to speak, and they will say, here comes the troublemaker. But uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta, I really want to thank you. I mean, your most eloquent speech struck a chord. And had I received a copy of your speech earlier, I think that even that alone should have broadened the scope of our conversation. As you can see, the Sultan and I are different. He's taller than me. He has a much more regal, appearance, uh, and he's spoken to you about the caliphate and its wonderful values. I'm a citizen of Nigeria living in Sokoto, but I'll come from a slightly different perspective, from the point of view of constitutionalism and constitutional governance and how all this fit into religion. Because I think the temptation for many of us is to assume that somehow religion is a problem. Um, and I think the, 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 press, the former president's uh, speech made the point very clear that religion, just like any other form of identity, whether it's ethnicity, religion, gender, the real problem is when these categories are left unattended to. It is then that they provoke problems. So I, I, I really think that we must appreciate the fact that all the values and the temptations, the trials that the people of Kenya have gone through, in summary, what struck me very powerfully was the idea of the tyranny of numbers, the tyranny of victory. And if I may add, the, the arrogance and the triumphalism that tends to characterize victory and how dangerous all these are. Because numbers are important. But they're only important up to a point. And the real challenge is what you do and how you aggregate these numbers for national development. 
And I think Nigeria and Africa in general must wake up to the threat that is posed by the emergence of what you call illiberal democracy. 20 years ago, this word was not talked about, but now it is in the vocabulary of political science. That there is a resurgence of democracies that look like democracies, but don't work like democracies. They conduct elections, they have judiciaries, they have political parties, but in the final analysis, they are a halfway house between the values of democracy and dictatorship and tyranny. And I think that the, the, the guest speaker has given us all the ingredients we require to be able to walk through the challenges. And I saw the vice president-elect smiling. He's somebody I already know. And uh, I appreciate the depth of his intellect and his capacity to process a lot of the issues that are on the table. There are many people, including Christians, who will be disappointed that Bishop Kuka is standing here because it's been, a lot of has been made out of the fact that we are dealing with a Muslim Muslim uh, set of people who have won the elections. What are the implications of this for Nigeria? And of course, with one side of our mouth, we also say as Nigerians that we want people to be able to govern us, who love us, who cherish us, and who understand the principles of the management of diversity. Now, we will not be nervous, and we really should not be nervous about the future. Not only because it is in the hands of God, but I think that the greatest value, and I hope that this lecture that has been delivered by Uhuru Kenyatta, although unfortunately, sir, you've been in Nigeria twice, but we are not yet Uhuru. We are still, we are aspiring. We're not yet Uhuru yet. But I hope that it provides the incoming government with the texture, the material that it requires, because how to build a good society is not a complicated thing. It is not a complicated thing. And the principles and the question, because one of the things that SGF said to me was also the fact that we'll be talking about the fact that as Nigerians, we are better together. Everybody knows that we are better together. But the first question to ask is, who are we? After 9-11, the American political scientists were asking the question, who are we? Because there was a problem in terms of who people are. And I think if you live in Nigeria, all of us know. And this is why those who listen to me will attest to the fact that I don't like to talk about religion, in part because I don't believe there is a religious problem. But somehow, the Western media, the Nigerian media, and the political elite have assumed the fact that there is something between religions and that there is a conflict between religions. There is absolutely no conflict you know, between religions. I say to people, assuming, for example, we all have knives in our houses. Assuming you come back from work and your wife is in the kitchen and uh, she comes to welcome you with a knife in her back with which she's been slicing onions, you will have no problem entering the house. But if you had a fight with your wife before you left the house and she, he, your husband comes back and knocks on the door, and you see your wife with a knife, you will pull back. So knives by themselves are not a problem. It's what you do with them. In the same way that, you know, identities are not, identities are not a problem. Identities are not a problem. It's how you activate those identities and what you do with them. Now, will I be walking around Nigeria? And people say to me, we worry about you being in Sokoto, you know. And, you know, when I speak, I can tell a million stories. And I give you an example, what happened in Sokoto. When, with the tragic story of Deborah, I was, I was, I had gone for a burial of the father of one of my priests, and I was on, the, on, on my way back in a car when I got a call to say that one of my priests called me to say, look, this is what is happening. And I, I got to Abuja, and I got telephone calls from everywhere. Where are you? I said, I'm in Abuja. He said, I, I hope you remain in Abuja. I hope you're not going back to Sokoto anytime soon. You know, my family members who called me, every, I said, so what am I supposed to do? No, remain in Abuja. Some people say, leave the country. And I said, to go where? And people could not understand. When I had to go back to Sokoto the next day, people said to me, I, mean, I had to just tell my friend, where are you? I, I told them I'm in Abuja. But when I got to Sokoto, I walked to my house. And uh, for me, it's, it's a very powerful image. As I entered my house, just... As I got to the gate, I saw an armored tank, soldiers, their numbers, guarding my house. And I was touched. I came out of the vehicles, and I greeted all the soldiers. I shook all of them. But I saw from their faces, they looked to me very much like Fulani people, the soldiers who were guarding my house. 
by their height and so on. So when I went in, then later in the evening, I came back and I started talking to them. There were about 12 or 14 of them. I, first of all, I looked at them, with all the equipment that they had in my house. After we greeted, I went back. At about 6.30 to 7, I came out, stood by my balcony. And I saw all of them <laughs> done their ablution. They are preparing for their salah. And they, they prayed in my house. I'm looking at them. And this is, this is Sokoto I'm supposed to be running away from. And here are these people, who, they are Muslims, they are Nigerians, they are here to protect me. Nigeria is a complex country of great possibilities, great contradictions, about which we will not be in this crisis. Managing diversity is a science. The World Bank knows this. My brother, Dr. Akunyumi, is here. He's going, he's going to talk about all this. They understand and no country, no business, no family, no organization has a future if you don't figure out how to manage diversity. I want to conclude by saying religion has been turned into a weapon and it's a weapon of choice for politicians and politicians. The danger and the challenge for us as religious leaders, because the Conservative Party in England, because the British government was a theocratic state, so to say, and the Conservative Party was literally part of the Anglican Church. And the joke used to be that the Anglican Church is the Conservative Party at prayer. The danger with being captured by politicians is that religious leaders, and I tell people, I, 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 when people talk about Ashwaju Bola, Tinibu, Atiku, Peter Obi, and all of these people, I work with the vice president-elect, I served for, eight, for six years or so in Atiku's university. Peter Obi is my very close friend of very many years. And I'm like, I'm a Nigerian, and I can work with anybody. And we must get to that point in which we have a no trust in ourselves. So religion in Nigeria, the section 10 of the constitution talks about the fact that no, no, the state should not adopt religion as a state religion. But we know that the reality is completely different. So the challenge for us going forward is to address the issue. What is the point, the meeting point between religion and politics? For us as Christians and as Muslims, we must understand we are first of all citizens of the Federal Republic of Nigeria who just happen to be Christians or Muslims. We could be anything else. And our inability to appreciate those differences also is directly related to the way the political class has continued to treat us. Let me put it that way. Because if you are not able to manage diversity well, people have gotten out their pens and their pencils. When you call out ministers, everybody is looking at who is from my village, who is from my town. Because, no thanks, we have come to associate opportunity, privilege, with having your own person in power. It's not the way to go, but the reality has led us otherwise. So I want to say that, first of all, Nigeria must heal. Nigeria must heal. But we also must have the courage to identify the scars, the wounds, the injuries. The worst thing that can happen to us is to pretend that everything is okay because everything is not okay. We have so many of our citizens who have lost their lives. We have so many of our citizens who are still in captivity. Managing diversity and managing differences is not about religious leaders talking together. It is about whether the state can create the kind of infrastructure, the guardrails, that can help Nigerians move as citizens of their country. But right now, there is how people feel because they are Christians or Muslims. There is how people feel because they are women. The, the levels and categories of, inclus of, of exclusion are so tremendous and so immense. So I hope that going forward, the things that the guest speaker has spoken about most eloquently, that is, how do you manage victory? How do you manage victory? How do you mutate? from being a politician who was contesting election to being a politician who has won election. Very often, very often, and what is clear to us in Africa, why religion, why ethnicity, why all these things continue to injure our, country, our countries is largely because we have not come to terms with the fact that power is just about, as somebody said, our turn to eat. Michaela Rong's book, I, mean, I know Michaela pretty well. She autographed a copy of her book. But her arguments were most eloquent because her arguments were largely 
If the Kalenjin did very well under Aramoy, and if your dad and Amoy Kibaki and other people who are, if they've done well, well, it was almost natural that the man contesting for election against you would say, it is our own turn to eat, and we can see what power has been. Therefore, it is our turn to continue with the things of that other people have done, privilege their community, privilege their... So if we cannot grow a country like this. We will remain volatile. And as you see in the, on a race track, everybody stands or kneels differently. There is no advantage. The location may be different. But when the gun is fired, the man who is right in the, in, closer to the inner part of the, of the ring is a little bit away. We don't expect that all of us will finish, but let us create an environment in which all of us can compete. And we will win, win according to our energy and our speed. I used to have a parishioner, and she came to me and she was complaining. You know, when, when they were, that is the local school examination, when they are over, most people will come to you and they say, my son passed Wayek. But if they don't pass, they say, Wayek fail my son. So the challenge for us in Nigeria is to create a condition, a situation where all of us can compete. We will never win the same prize. But let there be, as, the, as His Eminence the Sultan said, let loss of elections not be a punitive, because the problem with Africa, when you lose the elections, you don't get a chance to get back in. When you lose the elections, you can tell, you can lose your life. But you all, it also means that there will be no road to your village, that there will be no water. And African politics must remain and will remain violent. Unless and until we find an equilibrium in which, one, we are citizens of a country. My constitution allows me the right to stop being a Catholic or to stop being a Christian today. His eminence always jokes with me. He says, he says to me, you know, they sent you to Sokoto so that we can convert you and make you a Muslim. And the constitution allows that. But I also let him know that I'm looking forward to the day that I will also either baptize him. And, but we can talk about that. But the challenge for those, and I want, to, I want to end. I want to end by saying, right now, 133 million Nigerians are suffering from various levels of multidimensional poverty. Okay? I have not turned the light and seen a part where Muslims are living that they have light. I've not seen a part of the country where Muslims are eating and the rest of us are not eating. So we must come to terms with the fact that we are not bleeding, we are not suffering because we are Christians or Muslims, but we are in a country that is malfunctioning. How to make that country work for the rich, for the poor, for the aged, and for everybody is a challenge. It's not a challenge that everybody can win, but I think it's a challenge that a government that appreciates, it doesn't have all the answers must come to terms with the fact that there is a way of looking for and finding answers. I would like to just end by saying, and I make the point very clearly, it is in the struggle with the problems of Nigeria, I remain exceptionally optimistic. I travel the world. People say to me afterwards, where do you find this courage to say that Nigeria is working? When you say, okay, it may not be working, but this is one of the most beautiful countries in the world. And I, I, I'm, not, I'm not being flippant. When I went to the United States of America to study, I preached in a church. The, the parish priest called me and said, listen, you know, you speak with such eloquence. I would like you, we'll get you a green card. You know, you can settle here in America. And I looked at him. I said, you know, this God is a wonderful God. You are giving me a green card. My passport is actually a green passport. So what am I doing with a green card? So the young Nigerians who are living in our country, I always say to them, no, I'm not worried. Really, I'm not worried. Let them go. It's for the good of the country. The challenge for us as Africans is to think the way the Asians have thought. That is, you go to Europe, you go to America with a purpose. But that purpose means coming back to develop your country. But it also means that that country must create an environment in which you can feel confident to come and present the gifts that God has given you. You know, I have two, two young men. They're in America. They just finished from, from a prestigious university. I said, when are you coming home? They said, Bishop, coming home to do what? I said, no, coming home to... He said, we don't have an uncle who is a senator. We don't have anybody in government. What are we coming to Nigeria to do? 
So, Mr. President, I mean, Vice President elect, the challenge for you is to make this country believable, livable, credible, so that all of us together can stand in one tent and build a great nation. Once again, Secretary to Government, I want to thank you and thank the organizers for inviting me. God bless you and God bless our country. Dr. Matthew Hassan Kuka, Bishop of the Catholic Diocese of Sokoto on religious tolerance and inclusiveness. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, there is another contribution, and this is on security and development by the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Dr. Amina Mohammed, GCOM. She has sent in a message, and the next few minutes, we'll be listening to the message. Amina J. Mohammed, GCOM who served as advisor to four successive presidents of the Federal Republic of Nigeria on poverty, public sector reform, and sustainable development. She also served as minister of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. She is presently the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations and Chair of the United Nations Sustainable Development Groups. She served on numerous international advisory boards, including the UN Secretary General's high-level panel and post-2015 development agenda, as well as chaired the advisory board of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO Global Monitoring Report on Education. She is a recipient of various global awards. I invite you to now listen to the message of Dr. Amina Mohammed, GCON, on security and development. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is a real honor to address you today on this momentous occasion as we gather to celebrate the inauguration of President-elect His Excellency Bola Ahmed Tinubu. I extend my heartfelt congratulations to the government and to the people of Nigeria for yet another peaceful transition of power. This is a testament to the consolidation of democracy, peace, stability, and development in our great nation. I would also like to extend my congratulations to all the newly elected and re-elected officials. May you be guided by clarity of thought and unwavering determination to serve our people with the utmost dedication. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we are at an inflection point. Our world is facing a series of interlocking threats, security challenges, and cascading crises in food, energy, and finance that are magnified by the growing impacts of climate change. One quarter of humanity resides in conflict-affected areas, and as of mid-2022, over 100 million individuals have been forcibly displaced worldwide. The devastating effects of violence have not only impacted those directly involved in armed conflicts, but have reverberated throughout societies. And in our modern era, incidents involving malicious uses of digital technologies by state and non-state actors pose unique challenges and threats impacting our security landscape and the well-being of individuals and nations. We are witnessing a rising tide of inequalities in finance, trade and technology, both within and among nations. And the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated income inequality on a global and local scale, widening the gap between nations and societies. Moreover, our continent is disproportionately bearing the brunt of a climate crisis it did not create. The unequal suffering resulting from the effects of climate change represents one of the most profound injustices in our world today. And Nigeria itself faces a myriad of security challenges across various regions. Intercommunal tensions, farmer herder conflicts, organized armed conflict and terrorism continue to threaten the northern and middle belt regions 
while separatist agitation and the militancy menace in the southeast and south-south are a challenge. These security challenges impede progress and development in various sectors. And I commend the government of Nigeria and its armed forces for its national and sub-regional efforts to address these complex challenges. This is a moment for us to come together, united in our determination to address these multifaceted challenges. We must find local solutions to our national problems. We must foster international cooperation and Nigerian leadership, strengthen our collective resolve and embark on a pathway that champions inclusivity, equity, and sustainable development. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Sustainable development stands as humanity's most effective tool for prevention. It is the only way to address the underlying drivers of conflict and fragility. This is the security development nexus in action. In practice, this means inclusive, people-centered development solutions that address grievances, consolidate peace dividends, and build resilient communities where justice and dignity are our watchwords. It means leaving no one behind. It means delivering more under the United Nations Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals, and the African Union's Agenda 2063, which provide a framing for investing in the nexus. By creating decent jobs, particularly for youth and women, we empower individuals to live dignified lives and reduce the risk of social unrest and strengthen social cohesion. By bridging the digital divide and investing in new technology, we enable connectivity, drive economic growth, and create new possibilities for working together. Infrastructure development, implemented with a conflict-sensitive approach, will open up new opportunities for cooperation and foster the type of subnational integration that enhances economic empowerment against unexpected shocks. And by transforming our education system, we can equip future generations to fully participate in modern economies and to meet the demands of our fast-changing nation and world. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to propose four key elements which can catalyze accelerated sustainable development that addresses the underlying drivers of insecurity when they are present together. First, we need a strong policy environment that transcends disciplines. This means policies that integrate all sectors, from security to humanitarian to development. It means designing measures that address the more profound structural causes of insecurity, while also meeting urgent humanitarian needs and remaining acutely mindful of ongoing conflict dynamics. Investing in local economies across food security, energy access, and digital connectivity is key. Second, we need strong institutions. This means institutions that are built to last, ensure the rule of law, and provide a framework for a just and equitable society. Institutions that create an environment where citizens' rights are protected and deliver essential services to the people, such as education, health care, infrastructure, and social welfare. This means partnerships, collaboration, and joint planning across all levels of government. Local and state governments are essential players in this regard given their closeness to the people and their constitutional responsibilities. Third, people. We must invest in our people and our leaders at all levels, government, community, business, traditional fathers must all be at the table. A transformational education sector will also be crucial. The knowledge and skill sets needed for nation building must continue to evolve at pace. This includes women and youth, 70% of Nigerians are under 30. Girls under 30 alone comprise nearly one third of the total population. Women and youth bear the most significant toll from conflict, yet they're rarely given a seat at the mediation table. This is despite the fact that we know from experience and from independent research that pathways to peace are always more successful when they involve women and young people. Finally, these three elements policies, institutions, and people are only effective if combined with sound investments and accountability mechanisms. Recourse to justice, effective criminal justice systems, and transparent governance of resources are all required for sustainable development to meaningfully address the root causes of violence. 
sustainable development will never address the root causes of violence without recourse to justice. And for this, we must invest in people and supplies that deliver on the rule of law. In the words of Secretary General Guterres, from the smallest village to the global stage, the rule of law is all that stands between peace and stability. SDG 16 is our compass in this regard, and its fulfillment has ripple effects throughout all SDGs. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the existential threats of our time, from climate change to the threat of nuclear conflict, underscore the importance of multilateralism. No one nation can defend itself against these threats entirely on its own. Nations working together can achieve things that are beyond what even the most powerful state can accomplish itself. And that is why the United Nations was created. It is what we do. Convene for peace and give hope in times of cascading crises. The United Nations needs Nigeria and strong African voices to rise up, speak on the global stage, and double down on the multilateral solutions that meet the immense challenges of our time. The global narrative must be one that is shaped by all of us and not just by a few. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the latest peaceful democratic transition of power is yet more proof that Nigeria is better together. Our deepening democracy is consolidating the foundations of a prosperous future together. Your responsibility as leaders of this great nation is to continue this trajectory and to guide the people of Nigeria along inclusive pathways of peace and development that leave absolutely no one behind. It is time to be humbled by the weight of this responsibility for over 220 million Nigerians. And we at the United Nations are committed to helping you achieve a peaceful and prosperous Nigeria where all Nigerians will thrive. I thank you. Your Excellencies, Amin Aji Mohammed, GCUN, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations and Chair of the United Nations Sustainable Development Groups, delivering a message there. The Nigerian economy comes into focus as we take on the next contribution. This is strengthening the Nigerian economy, a contributor who will speak to the issues. is no other than Dr. Akim Adeshino, a former minister of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and presently the president of the African Development Bank Group, where he is currently serving his second term. Under his tenure, Dr. Adishina introduced innovations that made the African Development Bank Group achieve the highest capital increase since its inception in 1964. Dr. Adeshina has been honored with several awards, and in 2017, he was conferred with the World Food Prize, also known as the Nobel Prize for Agriculture. Dr. Adeshina was also announced as the winner of the 2020 Distinguished Fellowship Award by the Academy of Public Health, the flagship body of the West African Institute of Public Health in December 2020. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Akimumi Adeshino, President, African Development Bank, AFDB, strengthening the Nigerian economy. Your Excellency, President Mohabiru Buhari, I also call him a father as well. Your Excellency, the President-elect, Paul Ahmed Tinumbu, Your Excellency, the Vice President-elect, but their brother, Excellency Chetima. Your Excellency, President Uhuru Kenyatta, he and I have known each other forever, former President of the Republic of Kenya, 
the Secretary of the Government of the Federation, my dear brother, Boss Mustafa, and thank you for all you did to get me here. I finished the annual meetings of the African Development Bank, Mr. President, yesterday at about midnight, and I had to get on the flight to be here this morning. That's why I came in late here. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary. Excellencies, Governors, Your Eminence, Your Royal Highnesses, Distinguished Ladies and Gentlemen, Friends of Nigeria, Beloved Nigerians. I wish to start by thanking you, Mr. President, for inviting me to the ceremonies for the swearing in of the incoming President, His Excellency Bola Ahmed Tinubu. I would like to congratulate you, Mr. President, for this achievement of the seventh democratic transition of our beloved country. I would like to congratulate the incoming president and also the incoming vice president. I wish to thank the secretary of the government of the Federation, Boss Mustafa, the chairman and members of the transition, presidential transition council for inviting me to speak at this inaugural, inauguration lecture for the incoming president of Nigeria. It is such a great honor to share my views and perspectives after the wonderful speech that has been given by my very dear friend and brother, His Excellency President Uhuru Kenyatta, as our nation gets ready to have a passing of the baton between His Excellency President Mohammed Buhari and the incoming President, His Excellency Ashiwaju Ahmed Bola Tinumbu. It is your turn. <laughs> I wish to congratulate you, Mr. President, for your stewardship against difficulties of our nation for the past eight years. And thank you most sincerely, Mr. President, for your support for me as President of the African Development Bank. People say great things about what, by God's grace, we've been able to achieve. But unless I was sent on a mission and supported on that mission, it would not have been possible. I'd like to thank you, Mr. President, because without your support in 2015 and your standing beside me and behind me in the rough times of 2020, I will not be president of the African Development Bank. <laughs> Mr. President, I was brought up as a kid to always go back to their elders and thank them. And we always say that the person who sent you on an errand is the person you go back to to thank and give the report back to. And so I'll just say two things as I thank you because I will not have another opportunity to thank you. The African Development Bank, Mr. President, was ranked this year as the most transparent financial institution in the world. And last year, Your Excellency, Mr. President, the African Development Bank was ranked as the best multilateral financial institution in the world. And so as you take leave as president, please accept my deepest gratitude because without your support, I wouldn't have been there. And I want to thank you so much that you can take pride in these achievements as you go. And my dear brother, Bishop Kuka was talking about Nigerian. I am proudly Nigerian. I will live as a Nigerian. I'll die as a Nigerian. And I'll ask God for permission on resurrection day if I might just hold a green, white, green flag in my hand, and that would be great. I would like to congratulate the incoming president, His Excellency Bola Ahmed Tinumbu, GCFR, who will take over the mantle of leadership from Nigeria, from you. I'm delighted that my very dear friend, President Uhuru Kenyatta, the former president of Kenya, was invited to deliver the inauguration lecture. He is a great leader, not only in Kenya, a great leader for Africa. And I'm sure you must be wondering, there are actually two Kenyans that are actually here on this panel. Well, I lived in Kenya for many, many years, 10 years in Kenya. And I remember one day, President Goodluck Jonathan took me on a mission to Kenya, and we went to see President Uru Kenyatta. And as the two presidents were introducing members of their delegations, President Jonathan said to President Uru Kenyatta, here is Dr. Adeshina, Minister of Agriculture, to which President Kenyatta responded, yes, Adeshina is the Kenyan on loan to Nigeria. <laughs> we all laughed. Thank you, Mr. President Kenyatta, for what an incredibly powerful speech you gave us to us today. Very, very insightful. Your Excellencies, 
The election of a new president always elicits hope. Nigeria will be looking to you as President Chinumbu and Vice President Shetima on your first day in office with hope. Hope that you will assure security, peace, and stability. Hope that you will heal and unite a fractious nation. Hope that you will rise above party lines and forge a compelling force to move the nation forward with inclusiveness, fairness, equity, and justice. Hope that you will dramatically improve the economy, which is what I'm going to talk about today. And hope that you will spark a new wave of prosperity. And hope must be brought to the present, as hope defied makes the heart grow weary. Your Excellencies, the starting point must be macroeconomic and fiscal stability. Unless the economy is revived and the fiscal challenges addressed boldly, the resources to develop will not be there. No bird can fly if its wings are tied. Nigeria currently faces huge fiscal deficits, estimated at 6% of the GDP. This has been due to several challenges, including low receipts to dwindling revenues from export of crude oil, vandalism of pipelines, and illegal bunkering of crude oil. According to Nigeria's Debt Management Office, Nigeria now spends 96% of its revenue servicing debt. With the debt to revenue ratio rising from 83.2% in 2021 to 96.3% by 2022. Some will argue that the debt to GDP ratio at 34% is still low compared to other countries in Africa. And that is absolutely correct. But no one pays their debt using GDP. Debt is paid using revenue, and Nigeria's revenues have been declining. Nigeria earns revenue today to service debt and not to grow. The place to start, therefore, is to remove the inefficient fuel subsidies. Nigerian fuel subsidies benefit the rich, not the poor. Fueling theirs and government's endless fleet of cars at the expense of the poor. Estimates show that the poorest 40% of the population consume just 3% of petrol. Fuel subsidies are killing the Nigerian economy, costing the economy of Nigeria $10 billion alone in 2022. Now that means that Nigeria is borrowing what it doesn't have to borrow for. If it simply eliminates these inefficient subsidies and uses the resources well for national development. Rather, support should be provided to private sector refineries and modular refineries to allow for efficiency and competitiveness to drive down fuel pump prices. The newly commissioned Dangote refinery, by Your Excellency, Mr. President, the largest single train petroleum refinery in the world, as well as the petrochemical complex, will revolutionize Nigeria's economy. And congratulations to you, Mr. President. I'd also like to give congratulations to my dear brother, Aliko Dangote, for his amazing $19 billion investment. You got Nigerians, Mr. President, who believe in Nigeria. He's one of them. I am one of them. And we are many of us. We believe in Nigeria. Your Excellencies, there's also an urgent need to look at the cost of governance. The cost of governance in Nigeria is way too high and should be drastically reduced to free up more resources for development. Nigeria is spending very little on development. Today, Nigeria is ranked among the countries with the lowest human capital development index in the world, with a rank of 167 among 174 countries globally, according to the World Bank 2022 Public Expenditure Review Report. To meet Nigeria's massive infrastructure needs, According to this report, we require $3 trillion by 2050. According to the report, at the current rate, it will take 300 years to provide the minimum level of infrastructure needed for Nigeria's development. All living Nigerians today and many generations to come will be long gone by then. We must therefore change this and change it decisively. Nigeria must rely more on the private sector 
for infrastructure development to reduce the fiscal burdens on the shoulders of government. Your Excellencies, much can be done to raise tax revenue, as tax to GDP ratio in Nigeria is still low. This must include improving tax collection, tax administration, but moving from tax exemption to tax redemption, ensuring that multinational companies pay appropriate royalties and taxes and that leakages in tax collection are closed. However, simply raising taxes is not enough, as many question the value of paying taxes. Hence, a high level of tax avoidance. Many citizens provide their own electricity, sink their own boreholes to get access to water, repair their roads in their neighborhoods and in their towns. These are essentially high implicit taxes. Nigerians, therefore, today pay the highest implicit taxes in the world. Governments need to ensure effective social contracts by delivering quality public services. It is not the amount collected, it is how it is spent and what it's delivered. Nations that grow better, they run effective governments that assure social contracts with their citizens. Your Excellencies, we must rebalance the structure and performance of the economy. A very common refrain in Nigeria with every successful, successive government is, we need to diversify the economy. But is it really so? The economy of Nigeria is one of the most diversified in Africa, with the oil sector accounting for only 15% of the GDP, and 85% is accounted for by other sectors. Nigeria's challenge is not diversification. Nigeria's challenge is revenue concentration. And that is because the oil sector accounts for 75.4% of export revenue and 50% of all government revenue. The solution, therefore, is to unlock the bottlenecks that are hampering the 85% of the economy. These include low productivity, very poor infrastructure and logistics, despite gains being made, epileptic power supply, inadequate access to finance for small and medium-sized enterprises. Nigeria must also shift away from just relying on import substitution to export focused industrialization. No team in soccer can ever win by playing defense. Every team that wins in soccer, they win by playing offense. When you do export-led industrialization, that's offense. That's how economics will grow, and that's how we will thrive. Your Excellencies, for faster growth, Nigeria must fix decisively the issue of power once and for all. There is no justification for Nigeria not having enough power. The abnormal have simply become normal. Nigeria's private sector is hampered by the high cost of power. Providing electricity will make Nigerian industries more competitive, especially within the context of the African continental free trade area. And it's actually not brain surgery. Let me give two examples, Kenya and Egypt. With the support of the African Development Bank, working with President Kenyatta, he was able to expand electricity access in Kenya from 32% in 2013 to 75% in 2022. What an incredible achievement in just a period of 10 years. Today, 86% of Kenya's economy is powered by renewable energy. And one project where I came to visit with the President it's called the Last Mile Connectivity Project. The bank support, it allowed Kenya to connect the poorer households, 2.3 million of them, to electricity. And that's 12 million people provided with affordable connection to grid power. Thank you, Mr. President. It was a fantastic program. I'm just coming from Egypt. In 2014, Egypt had electricity deficit of 6,000 megawatts. Well, by 2022, Egypt had 20,000 megawatts of surplus power generation. Amazing. So it can be done. I'd like to commend the federal government on the leadership of the president for the tireless efforts being made in this area 
with recent commissioning of several power projects across the country and with so much private sector, but still much needs to be done. Nigeria should invest massively in renewable energy, especially solar. God loves Nigeria because solar, we got sun all the time in Nigeria. And that's why the African Development Bank is implementing $25 billion in what we call Desert to Power Program to provide electricity for 250 million people all across 11 countries, including all the Sahel and including all of Northern Nigeria. Your Excellencies, for inclusive development, which my dear sister, Amina Mohammed, just spoke about, Nigeria must completely revive its rural areas. Nigeria's rural areas are forgotten and have become zones of economic misery. To revive and transform these rural economies, we must make agriculture their main source of income, a business, and a wealth-creating sector. To be clear, agriculture is not a development activity. It is not a development sector. Agriculture is a business. The development of special agro-industrial processing zones will transform agriculture in Nigeria, add value for agricultural value chains, and attract private sector food and agricultural businesses into these rural areas. Special agro-industrial processing zones will help to turn the rural areas into new zones of economic prosperity and create millions of jobs. The African Development Bank, with your support, Mr. President, Islamic Development Bank, and the International Fund for Agricultural Development are currently supporting Nigeria to implement a $518 million special agro-industrial processing zone program in seven states of the country. And we've received, and the FCT, already we have requests from 19 states to have that done. We are ready, Mr. President and incoming, Mr. Vice President and incoming President, we are fully ready to help you to expand this into every single state in Nigeria. And we are equally ready to help to revamp agricultural lending institutions to help modernize food and agriculture sector. Your Excellencies, the best asset of Nigeria is not its natural resources. Nigeria's best asset is its human capital. We must therefore invest heavily in human capital to build up Nigeria's skills, skills that we need to be globally competitive in a rapidly digitized global economy. We must build world-class educational institutions, accelerate skills development in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, as well as in ICT, computer coding, which are not the jobs of the past, but the jobs of the future. Your Excellencies, there is an urgent need to unleash the potential of the youth. Today, over 75% of the population of Nigeria is under the age of 35. This presents a demographic advantage, but it must be turned into an economic advantage. Nigeria must create youth-based wealth. We must, move from, we must move from the so-called youth empowerment programs. The youth do not need handouts. They need investments. The current banking system does not, will not lend to the youth. If you're a young person, you go to a bank, they ask you, how old are you? You say 21 years old. They ask you, go bring your tax receipts for the last 25 years. How does that work? Special funds, while palliative in approach are also not systemic and are also not sustainable. What is needed to unleash the entrepreneurship of the youth of Nigeria are brand new financial ecosystems that understands, values, promotes, and provides financial instruments and platforms for nurturing business ventures of the youth in Nigeria at scale. The African Development Bank and partners, including the Adjunct Francais de Development, Islamic Development Bank and others, we launched right here in Nigeria the $618 million IDAIS program to develop digital and creative enterprises. Mr. President, under your leadership, this is one of the great things I hope that you're most proud of. These things will create 6 million jobs and add $6.3 billion to Nigeria's economy. Your Excellencies, as I close, the African Development Bank is currently working with central banks and countries all across Africa to design and to support the establishment 
of youth entrepreneurship investment banks. These will be new financial institutions run by young, professional, highly competent experts and bankers to develop and deploy new financial products and services for businesses and ventures of young people. Several African countries have already agreed to set up the youth entrepreneurship investment banks. Nigeria should establish the Youth Entrepreneurship Investment Bank. Your Excellency, Mr. President, thank you very much. Your Excellency, Mr. Vice uh, uh, President-elect, let me now close. Nigeria, Nigeria's economy needs to soar. You have an incredible opportunity to make history. History by building a resurgent Nigeria, a united and prosperous Nigeria. It is Nigeria's turn. I wish you all the very best for success. May God bless you, may God help you, and may God bless the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Dr. Akimumi Adishino, President, African Development Bank, speaking on strengthening the Nigerian economy. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, a lot has been spoken about youth inclusiveness and perspective of the youth in this inauguration lecture, now comes with the next contributor, Dio Israel, a holder of the LLB and Master of Arts in International Relations. He was named one of the 100 most influential people of African descent under 40 as part of the 2017 celebration of the UN Decade for People of African Descent at the One UN Plaza in New York. Dio is a member of the British Council Global Changemakers Network, Connecting Futures Program, and a fellow of the US State Department International Visitors Leadership Program, which has produced over 400 heads of government globally. Presently, is serving as the National Youth Leader of the All Progressives Congress, APC, in Nigeria. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Dio Israel, National Youth Leader, All Progressives Congress, speaking on youth inclusiveness. Your Excellency, President and Commander in Chief of the Armed Forces of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, a fine gentleman who served this country with all honor and was looking forward to go back to Katina on Monday by the grace of the Almighty, President Muhammad Ubuari GCFR. Please clap for the President. My father, the President elect of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Shuajibola Ahmed Tinubu. She's here for ably represented here by the Lion of Borno. As a matter of fact, the Lion of Northeast of Nigeria, <laughs> distinguished Senator Kashim Shatifa, Shatima GCON. Excellency Abari Yaku, the former president of Kenya, President Uhuru Kenyatta. I love Kenya a lot, I've been there a few times. And it's always great to listen to you speak, Mr. President. Excellency, the national chairman of my great party, my own direct boss, distinguished Senator Abdullah Adamo. Let me, uh, of course, the deputy speaker of the House of Representatives, the SGF, I'm very grateful for the honor to be here. All the distinguished guests present, including my national, deputy national chairman. I'm a party man, so please allow me and the National Secretary of my great party, and my wonderful youth leaders of my party who are present here, other protocols duly extended. It is such an honor for me to stand here 
on this stage. I had a similar honor in 2002, October 1, when President Obasanjo was hosting his Independence Day event, and he hosted the Summit of Nigerian Children, ICO. And I had the honor of representing the children of Nigeria on this podium at that event. And a few years later, I'm here today representing the youth of Nigeria, in particular the youth of our party. And I want to begin by telling you a story. I love stories. A young boy was trying to kill a bee. And the father said to him, stop, don't do that. And the boy said to the father, daddy, what's wrong? It's just a bee. And the father said, don't you ever say it's just a bee. It's not just a bee. Because without this bee, thousands of plants around the world would go unpollinated. Without this bee, the rates of fruit and vegetable produce would decline and lead to famine. Without this bee, many crops would die and farmers would go bankrupt. Without this bee, the world will go without honey and we will eat our pancakes dry. It's not just a bee. And that reminds me that the bee here we're talking about is the wonderful young people of Nigeria. We're not just young people. We're not just youths. We're the lushness of this green land. The best resource, like Dr. Fakim Radishino spoke about, that Nigeria has to offer. The best export of our great nation, the Federal Republic of Nigeria. We may look insignificant, but we're over 60% of the population of this country, and more importantly, President Buhari, we are your tomorrow. And it reminds me of another story. President Kenyatta, you'll be familiar with your sister, Wangari Matai. She spoke about the story of the human bed. And the story was about a bush that was burning. It was a strong fire in the forest. And all the animals were running away looking for an escape. And they were running, the lions, the tigers, the elephant, all of them were running out of the forest. And there was this little human bed, a small boy like me, sitting quietly. And then he observed that the nation was on fire. And what the human bird did was fly to the nearest river, use his little beck to fetch some water, run back into the forest and pour it there. Run back to the river, got some water with the little beck, ran to the fire and pour it there. And all the other animals were smiling and laughing and saying, what do you think you're doing? Can you save this forest from the furnace? And the human bird looked at the elephant and all the other animals and said, I may be just but a human bird. As small as I am, I will do my best to save the forest from the fire. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the youth of Nigeria, the human bed, a country has experienced military challenges over the years. We've gone through abuse, we've gone through many poverty challenges, but the youth of Nigeria has continued to be creative and innovative, in particular with our creative industry, entertainment and sport. We are putting Nigeria on the map. We may not be able to end poverty in Nigeria in one day, but we're creating solutions in fintech, in sport, in entertainment. We're fighting poverty. We're creating corporations like Jumia. We're creating companies like uh, the other companies doing many other fintech companies across Nigeria. Andela, Flutterwave, many. That is our own way of being a human being, of solving Nigeria's unemployment and poverty problem. And so when you have the population that brings us the Grammy Award, that brings Nigeria on the entertainment scene, that brings on the screen in Antarctica, in the Caribbean, in North America, at the Grammys Award and the Emmys Award, why would you waste such a resource? What are we doing with this resource? And that's why yesterday at the Villa, we had an interaction with the president, Bama Dubuari. And everybody was thanking the president and said, thank you for Second Niger Bridge. Thank you for Maradi Trail Service. Thank you for Lagos Ibadan Expressway. I said to Mr. President, sir, thank you for the not too young to run bill. Because by that single act of leadership of signing the not too young to run bill into law, it created a generational shift that made a 28 years old girl become a member of the House of Representatives in this 10th Assembly. If you want to clap for the youth, clap for us. 
And so, if we're going to deepen democracy, we've got to deepen youth participation in the public sector and in good governance. We've got to give young people a seat at the table. But let me also warn leaders, we have decided among ourselves, if you don't give us a seat at the table, we will go to the Kubo wood market, we will buy woods, we'll buy nails, we'll make our own chair, and we'll bring it to the table. We must deepen youth participation at all level, at local government level, at House of Assembly level, at governorship level, at the Senate, National Assembly, and even at the top level. And that's why as I traveled across the country, campaigning for Ashwa Ajibola, went to 33 states on my own, with my team of youth leaders engaging the youth in the community. Our message was simple. The Tinubu presidency is going to be an inclusive administration for young people because it's going to come and work with us to build a Nigeria for us. The reality is that a future for us without us is not a sustainable future. And that's why as government, as people, we have a role to play. We have a lot to do. And to do that, we need to ensure that we create platforms for young people to get involved. And not just platforms like Youth Parliament or Youth Council. I was a former Deputy Senate President of the Nigerian Children's Parliament. So you can call me Distinguished Senator Dio Israel. But beyond all of those youth platforms that we get, young people must begin to play mainstream politics. Their importance, you can never overemphasize it. I won't be standing before you here today, but for the opportunity to be in the Children's Parliament, to be a one-day commissioner for information on the Achiwaju Bola Ahmed Tinubu in Lagos State under his one-day governor program, and also be a member of the British Council Connecting Futures program, the IVLP program, the Global Change Makers program, and many other activities created to give young people a chance. Those years of programs and activities prepared me, and I think that we need to do more to intensify platforms and opportunities to prepare the young people for the future. We need concerted effort to raise the next generation of Thomas Sankara, Patrice Lumumba, Kwame Nkrumah, and because President Kenyatta is here, Jomo Kenyatta. We need to consciously create the next generation and build and mentor the next Mama Dubwari, the next Ashiwaju Bola Ahmed Tinumbu. Because Ashiwaju did not get here in one day. It was an, a cut, a, a, a a combination of many years, over 30 years, of participation in governance preparation for where he is today. And so we need to begin to prepare that 20 years old person, that 30 years old person that is going to take over from you and lead Nigeria to the path of greatness that you have done. There are many like us who are out there. And you know, I'm a Christian and I love to take my wisdom from the scripture. It says that children are like arrows in the hand of the mighty. In other words, if you are a mighty man, you're going to war, you have an arrow in your hand. If you keep the arrow in your pocket or in your bag, it's useless. You've got to stretch your bow. You've got to pull back the arrow. That is only when it can bring you results. You've got many young Nigerians who are filled with talent, who are filled with skills. They're not perfect, but you've got to make use of them and give them a platform to take responsibility. And we're doing our best on our own. We're building enter, uh, empires in techs, in corporate financing. We're raising capitals, even more than some banks. Many young people are raising investment in multi-billion dollars. So who says we are not ready? We are the ready generation. We only need an opportunity. We only need a seat at the table. We have excelled in sport. We've put Africa on the map. We have created results. We only need intergenerational collaboration because we're also responsible for the future of this country. We are going to be living in that future. And that's why, as I begin to wrap up, I want to take another wisdom from Joel chapter 1, verse 28. It says, in the last day I will pour my spirit upon flesh. And it says, your sons and daughter will prophesy. In other words, they will speak of the things that have not happened. It means they will be futuristic. They see tomorrow and they can begin to walk into creating that tomorrow. So if we have the capacity to create tomorrow, then you need to give us a seat at the table to help you build tomorrow. It says, and your Old men shall dream dreams, and your young men will see vision. 
We need to help our young people not just to see vision, but to run with that vision by building their capacity. And that's why I'm going to go into three different action points for all of us before I sit down. Action point number one for government. As government leaders, Vice President Shatima, the administration of the Tinubu Shatima must prioritize giving young people tools to become equal discussion partners like I am today. You must prepare us, provide a platform at which we can be more than just essays and SLAs and PAs, essay media to give us real assignment, give us challenges. Let me borrow the word of Caleb in the scripture. Give us this mountain. But you must prepare us. We must prioritize building capacity, training, and reforming of the educational system. Before I came in to become national youth leader of the APC, I was privileged by the grace of God and with the support of my governor, Mabaji Delushala Sawolu, to be a permanent board member of the Lagos State Universal Basic Education Board, SUBEB. And the reason I was a permanent board member of SUBEB was also because there was a policy in Lagos that said that our board must have a woman and a youth as members of the board. Vice President Shatima, it is our call on behalf of the youth of our party that the new administration should expand its policy to ensure that no board appointment agency parastatals without a young person as a member. <laughs> youth, am I speaking your mind? We are demanding a seat at the table. Every board, every agency, NFPC, NPA, NPIC, every board, a seat for young people. We have work for the party. We have the capacity. We have the potential. We need the platform. Are we not ready? Can we not do it? Test us, sir. We need to give young people the skills to be able to compete globally. We need to create a platform for internship and volunteerism. Like Dr. Akiko Madeshino said, we must invest in youth innovation, youth community action, and youth enterprise. The many young people who are running development projects in their communities, NGO projects, they need grants, they need funding. We need to put money where our mouth is and support the young people. We must make it easy for young people to run for public office. And that's why I want to thank President Buhari one more time for the Not Too Young to Run bill. Building on that, I want to thank my national chairman, distinguished Mr. Abdullah Adamo. I went to the NWC when we got elected, and I asked that they please consider giving the young people 50% discount on the nomination form of the party. From presidency, that was 100 million, governorship, that was 50 million, house senate, that was 10 or 12 million, and we were able to get 50% discount nomination form for young people 18 to 40. I want to thank all my NWC colleagues for supporting that, and the NEC members that gave that a life. Because of that, Mr. President, Mr. Vice President-elect, we have over 13 young people under 40 elected into this 10th National Assembly of Nigeria who took advantage of our discount on nomination forms. We must strengthen civic education. We must create a sense of history. We must create a platform for intergenerational engagement. We must introduce policies that deepen youth inclusion in governance like the Lagos State Suburb Law that allows for one young person to be on the board and many more that the Tinubu Shetima administration will bring to birth. And to our parents, let me speak to you fathers and mothers. We must be like, I'm going to refer to the scriptures again, like Anna when she was raising Samuel. She raised him consistently with a mindset that she was raising someone special. It, no child becomes great without a concerted effort from his or her parent. We must make an effort to concertedly raise the next generation. In the family, we must restore back values in the family. You must remember that you are raising a king. <laughs> to you, my young brothers and sisters, the youth of our great nation, in this hall and those watching me on live television, I'm saying this to you. You must be ready to stand up and take responsibility. You must be ready to learn, unlearn, and relearn in any form, either through individual programs or by registering from programs like the Carrington Youth Fellowship, 
the Mandela Washington Fellowship, the yearly program, and some of the ones that I participated on, the IVLP International Visitors Leadership Program, the British Council Global Changemakers, Connecting Futures, and many more that will be created under the Tinubu Shetima administration. You must be ready to go out, go online, go and sign up, go and apply, be, you know, go and showcase your capacity. Don't wait there for manna to come on your table. You've got to go out of your tent. Go out there and volunteer. I started my NGO when I was eight. I remember in December, I think it was uh, 1999, 2000. I was at the Ganifawa Emi Olisa Bakobas This Day Lecture at the This Day Dome in Apapa Suwile in uh, Lagos. Apapa Lagos. I remember the one million mama of Ganifawa Emi. I was in the crowd. In 1998, when Afsa Tabiola came back to Nigeria to run kind, I was the youngest at the table myself, Jimmy Ate, Jikate, I think it was with NTA, Jim, Jikato, with NTA, Jimmy Ate, Collins Babalola, and many of us were literally Inka. A young boy in my school uniform, but already getting involved in the NGO. And that's why in 2002, May, I was selected to represent all the young people of Nigeria at the UN General Assembly Special Session on Children in New York and came back to Nigeria to chair the ICO in October. At a young age, I was already getting involved. I was volunteering. I was participating. I was doing community action in my secondary school. You have to be able to build your own future. You have to step out. You cannot wait for government to do it all for you. You need to take responsibility. We need to invest in digital literacy and provide access to information for young people. And let me wrap up, Your Excellency, with a story. A young boy went to an old man. I said the story at the villa some time ago. I'll repeat it. And he said, Baba, I want to know what the future holds for me. Is my future great or is it dim? And the old man said to the young man, what is in your hand? He said, I have a butterfly. He said, so what do you want to know? He said, I want you to tell me if this butterfly is dead or alive. The butterfly was alive in the hand of the young man, but his goal was that if the old man, wise old man, said that the butterfly was dead, he would open his hand and the butterfly would fly out. And if the old man said the butterfly was alive, he would crush it first and then open his hand to show the old man that the butterfly was dead. And the elderly man, like President Muhammad Dubwari, calm, quietly looked at the young man and said, young man, the life and the future of the butterfly is in your hands. <laughs> Distinguished senator Kashim Shatima Ashwajibola Ahmed Tinumbu, the life and the future, the growth, the progress of Nigeria over the next four, at least, maybe eight years, is in both of your hands. Do it right and carry the youth along. Thank you and God bless you. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Dio Israel. The National Youth Leader All Progressive Congress on the topic youth inclusiveness on this day that we take the 2023 presidential inauguration lecture and he has brought forward the youth perspective. While Dio Israel was speaking, Cyril and I felt that perhaps the definition of youth in Nigeria should involve myself and Cyril, irrespective of age, <laughs> so that that way we can borrow some of Dio Israel's energy. But more than anything else, Dio has spoken about intergenerational relationship and getting youth included and giving them a seat on the table. And if they do not get a seat on the table, they will make their own seat with a carpenter and bring their chair to the table. Your Excellency, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Dio Israel. <clears throat> Excellencies, the chairman of the Presidential Transition Council, 
and who is also the secretary to the government of the Federation, like I said at the beginning um, of the proceedings today, has led a stellar cast to deliver the inauguration activities, spending sleepless nights and staying awake to ensure that they deliver an incredible set of activities. For this particular activity, His Excellency, the SGF, has given responsibility to B.E. Jediagba, who is Chair, Permanent Secretary, and also Solicitor General, to hold the position of Chairman of the subcommittee of this inauguration lecture. And for her and members of her team, and for the SGF, let's hear a resounding Abuja round of applause. Excellencies, the inauguration keynote speaker, His Excellency Uhuru Kenyatta, describes President Muhammadu Buhari as his brother. And the relationship between East Africa and West Africa is a long, long relationship for which I have benefited immensely. As he visits us this period, he must try those things that are close and a little bit different from Ugali and Chapati, Sukuma Wiki, and also Mudakoi. Your Excellency, Nigeria just holds the Guinness Book of Records with a young lady named Hilda Bassi for the longest cooking time for a cookathon. Her name, Hilda Bassi, and our jollof rice continues to be one of the finest in the world. And as we heard from one of our speakers, food can indeed become an economic resource and can become a business. Africa food, Africa's food is indeed one of the best in the world and we must promote it across board. It is delightful to be here this morning and for all of us who are here in the room, we're making history. It is time, Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, to invite to the podium the special advisor to the president, policy and coordination, Dr. Habiba Lawal, to deliver a vote of thanks ahead of all the other speeches. Dr. Lawal, let's encourage her as she makes her way to the podium. Your Excellency President Muhammad Buhari, Your Excellency the Vice President elect Senator Kashim Shatima, Your Excellency the President or former President of Kenya, Uhuru Kenyatta, Your Excellencies, please permit me to align with the already established protocol. On behalf of the Presidential Transition Council, I stand before you today to express our heartfelt gratitude as we bring this all-important lecture to a close. We are deeply humbled and honored by the overwhelming support and active participation from every one of you. We would like to extend our sincere appreciation to our esteemed guest speaker, former president of Kenya, Uhuru Kenyatta, for gracing us with his presence and delivering an enlightening keynote address on deepening democracy for development. Your wisdom, insight, and experiences have provided us with invaluable perspectives on national unity and the role of democracy in advancement. Your presence here today serves as a testament to the strong bonds of friendship and collaboration between our two nations. Our deepest gratitude also goes to His Eminence, Muhammad Saad Abubakar III, Sultan of Sokoto, and the most revered Dr. Martin Hassan Kuka, Bishop of the Catholic Diocese of Sokoto, for sharing their profound thoughts on religious tolerance and inclusiveness. Your words have reminded us of the importance of embracing diversity fostering religious harmony, and building a society that values and respects the rights and beliefs of its people. 
We also, would also like to express our appreciation to Dr. Akin Wumi Adeshina, President of the African Development Bank, and Amina J. Mohammed, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, for their insightful discussions on strengthening the Nigerian economy in the Tinubu years and security and development, respectively. Your expertise and contributions have shed light on the critical areas that underpin our nation's progress and prosperity. We are truly grateful for your commitment to Africa's development and your dedication to supporting Nigeria's growth. A special note of thanks goes to Dayo Israel, National Youth Leader of the All Progressive Congress, for his enlightening presentation on youth inclusiveness in governance. Your passion for active participation of the younger generation in governance and their engagement is undoubtedly a great contribution to the evolution of our nation. We thank you. To the amazing organizing community, volunteers, and other support staff, your enduring commitment and tireless effort has been the driving force behind this seamless, momentous lecture. Your dedication and organizational skills have been truly commendable. Thank you for your relentless hard work. We we'll also like to thank our esteemed guests, distinguished personalities, excellencies, scholars, and representatives from different sectors, members of the media we, who actively and continue to echo our mandate. We thank you for coming. To the Secretary of the Government, to the Government of the Federation, my immediate boss, Boss Mustafa CFR. I say thank you for your exceptional leadership, meticulous planning, and commitment to excellence. Indeed, your strategic insights and attention to detail have played a pivotal role in shaping the philosophy and objective of this lecture. To the president-elect and the vice president-elect, as you stand on the preface of assuming the highest office in the land, you have been chosen to be the voice of the people the guardian and hopes and of their hopes and aspirations, and the catalyst for positive change. The decisions you make will vibrate far beyond your term in office. I have no doubt that your leadership will be of positive transformation to leave behind a nation that is stronger, more united, and more prosperous. Lastly, and on behalf of the entire, again, the Transition Council, I would like to express our deepest gratitude his Excellency President Muhammad Buhari for your unwavering, invaluable support and commitment to the whole transition process. Your Excellency, your vision, dynamic leadership, and dedication to fostering a democratic culture that values inclusivity and unity have laid the foundation for this remarkable gathering. We are truly honored to serve under your leadership and grateful for the opportunities you have created for sustainable national development. In conclusion, let us carry the spirit of this inauguration lecture with us as we leave this venue. May we continue to embrace the values of unity and democratic consolidation. Let us strive to bridge the divisions in our society, promote dialogue and collective responsibility, and work towards a future where every Nigerian feels valued, respected, and included in our nation's development trajectory. I thank you all for your kind attention, and may God bless our nation. Thank you. Your Excellencies. Dr. Habiba Lawal, Special Advisor to the President, Policy and Coordination, and in her words, the President-elect, the Vice President-elect have been chosen to be the voice of the people. It is our hope that every Nigeria feels valued and respected and included in development. Let's hear another round of applause for Dr. Habiba Lawal. And on that note, Your Excellencies, Distinguished invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's time now for me to invite to the podium 
a man who sits as vice president elect and he would be making his remarks in that position. His Excellency Vice President Elect Kashim Shetima. Your Excellency President Muhammadu Buhari, GCFR. Your Excellency former President. Uhuru Kenyatta, the Deputy Speaker of the Federal House of Representatives, the maverick politicians of Turakin Kepi, the National Chairman of the APC, and members of the NWC of the party, His Eminence, the Sultan of Sokoto, my Lord Bishop Hassan Matthew Kuka, the President of the ADB, Dr. Akiwumi Adishina, the owner of IPE, and my young brother, Dayo Israel, members of the National Assembly present here, our service chiefs, our other foremost traditional rulers, distinguished guests, ladies, and gentlemen. I begin by thanking President Mahmoud Buhari. Ali bin Abi Talib said, power does not change a man, it reveals a man. In eight years of stewardship, you were subjected to the most curious of attacks. You were demonized. You were dehumanized. You were even robbed of your humanity, you are called the brain of Sudan. But never for a single moment did you harass or use any extra judicial means to extract vengeance. <laughs> About a year ago, the nation was at the brink of an implosion. There was acute agitation for a power shift. For the first time in the contemporary history of Nigeria, I dare to be contradicted by anybody. For the first time, a sitting president provided the enabling environment for the conduct of a just and peer primaries in his political party. That was how President-elect Ashwaju Bola Ahmed Tinubu emerged as the flag bearer of the APC. And as H.S. Aga said, the truth that sets men free is most often the truth that men prepare not to hear. The digital anarchists can say whatever they want, but the truth is that President Muhammad Buhari conducted the purest and just election in the contemporary history of this nation. Rob Waldo Everson said, your actions are so loud that I do not hear what you say. Beyond the famous handshake for Raila Odinga, on March 26, 2021, at the burial of late President John Magopuli of Tanzania at the Jamhuri Stadium in Dodoma, Tanzania, the then President Uhuru Kenyatta was eulogizing late President John Magufuli. At about 12.52 to 12.55 p.m., there was a call to prayer and Afghan from a nearby mosque. President Uhuru Kenyatta paused as a mark of respect to the Muslim people. After the call of prayer, he said, Oleni Wafeni Mendeli Kwa Kusema. Let me continue with my speech. And the dramatic pause was welcomed with raucous applause by all our attendees. Mayo Angelo said, I have come to learn that people may forget what you said. People may forget what you did, but people may never forget what you have made them feel. 
He made me feel proud as an African. He made me proud as someone who believes in the progress and unity of the African nation. The Sultan of Sokoto spends a greater time of his time crisscrossing the length and breadth of this nation, fostering unity and diversity for our great nation. And my very good friend, Bishop Matthew Hassan Kuka, like Ghani Pawahimi, is not a man of in-between. He's the gut fly, the empan terrible. You either love him passionately or hate him intensely. <laughs> when he attended the interreligious conference at the Vatican, along with the 14th Emir of Kano Muhammad Sanusi II, Caesar Alietha, a Spanish telecoms giant, Mogul, offered $1 billion to the Catholic Church. The Catholic pontiff is a Jesuit priest who believes passionately in education. He advised Caesar Alieza to embed that point in education in the developing world. And Bishop Kuka and the 14th Emir invited him to come to northern Nigeria. That was how the Proputoro experience started unveiling here in Nigeria. And lo and behold, the religious merchants went to town that Bishop Kuka is trying to Christianize the North. I came out and defended him. And there was a payback time about eight years down the line. When I emerged as the vice presidential candidate of the APC, people expected him to come out firing on all cylinders. They never knew of my relationship with Matthew Kuka. He chose the path of the golden mean and said, look, Nigerians, you all have to write. You all have the right to vote for the candidates of your choice, but we don't have to demonize any person. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I began my boss's speech by thanking our esteemed keynote speaker, His Excellency, Mr. Uhuru Kenyatta, for his remarkable address. As a leader of a great and proud African nation, you have personally managed the crucial yet often difficult interplay between democracy and development. We were all cultivated and listened with unbroken attention to your portrayal of the political, economic, and social forces that describe the arena of national governance. Like you, I'm an African. I love our continent dearly. If I were asked 100 times to choose my own birthplace, then 100 times over I will choose to be an African and a Nigerian. I am proud to belong to this lineage and to be of this place. My heart beats proudly to see how my fellow Nigerians and Africans are creating their own democratic, political cultures and institutions to fit the conditions and challenges of their societies. The essence of democracy merges dialogue, justice, and peer play. That it is more than a form of government. It is a way of life, a distinctive manner of thought and conduct for a leader. As such, it challenges each leader to be his better step, and this can be difficult at times, but remains indispensable to the steady functioning of democracy. Democracy is a benign paradox. It guarantees freedom. Yet its survival is dependent on the responsible and limited use of that freedom. In the long run, it is the best form of government because it allows the majority to have its way while safeguarding the fundamental interests of the minority. It is forever a work in progress, a road that never ends, yet one that grows finer and less wearisome the more you walk it. I hold precious our democracy not as a tidy abstraction, but as, as a pragmatic vessel that can take this nation to save our harbor in all aspects of our collective existence. Through the lenses of our national experience, I can see the scales balancing the merits of democracy against those other forms of government. I can see plainly that an imperfect democracy 
is better than the most perfect dictatorship. It is more just, more humane, and even more productive. We have emerged from one of the most fiercely contested elections in the annals of humanity, and the resounding echoes of the promises we have made serve as a haunting reminder that failure is a luxury we cannot afford. We are surrounded. We are surrounded by the expectations of our citizens, the skepticism of our opponents, and the chain of chaotic events that necessitate the proper functioning of democracy. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as I stand on this elevated ground, what I behold are not mere individuals. I see a visual manifestation of the expectations placed upon us in this hall. The allure of this system of governance lies not in the ostentation of authority. What distinguishes democracy is the recognition that power is not ours to claim. We, adorned in flowing robes and fancy suits, are but servants duty-bound to never underestimate the true proprietors of this power. We are here to serve. We are here to listen. We are here to be held accountable. We are not saints on an evangelical mission. Therefore, like every mortal, we may stumble here and there. However, none of these mistakes will be intentional. We shall never be oblivious to the impermanence of this power. And we acknowledge that we shall be judged by man, time, and God. No doubt, our hearts swell with gratitude. No doubt, assuming the mantle of leadership in these troubled times warrants deep reflections. We shall undoubtedly honor and celebrate this opportunity. Yet I implore you, let the strength of our jubilation be hushed, for now is not the time to revel in the enchantment of triumph. Instead, let us come together in solemn unity and recognize the realities that afflict our nation. As Winston Churchill said, truth is so precious that it has to be surrounded by a bodyguard of lies. In politics, a lot of lies have been traded on as the truth. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I was a child of necessity. There is no any Islamization agenda. Wala Tinubu. Ashwaju Bola Ame Tinubu is a Muslim who is married to a Christian. Not only a Christian, but a pastor of the Redeemed Christian Church of God. Someone who has not Islamized his family, people are alluding that he has the intention to Islamize the nation. The likes of Bishop Puka, I want to commend them for giving testimony to the truth. When I was the governor of Borno State, Borno is 90% Muslim. Churches were destroyed by the Boko Haram insurgents in southern Borno. When I expressed my desire to rebuild those churches, I was advised against it. It's tantamount to political harikiri for you to embark on such a venture. But I told the people that the Christians in Borno are stakeholders in the Nigeria project. They are my brothers and sisters. I went ahead and rebuilt those churches. And politics is about perception, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. As we begin the formation of a new administration, I deliberately, I deliberately picked an Igbo man, a Catholic, to be my chief security officer. Stand up for recognition, please. For the purpose of inclusivity and togetherness, again, I deliberately picked a Northern Christian to be my ADC. So the so-called founder of Boko Haram 
is going to be protected by... <laughs> Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I know that the odyssey that lies ahead shall test our mettle, patience, and resilience. It shall also demand sacrifice and unyielding resolve. But we shall confront uncomfortable truths. The observations by Dr. Akiumi Adeshina are poignant. And I want to differ from the perspective of my junior brother, Dario Israel. There won't be a Tinubu Tetima administration. There is an outgoing Buhari administration. There will be a, Buha, uh, there will be a Tinubu administration. As Pyro Agnew said, I had all vices, including the office of the vice president. A vice president is as powerful as his loyalty to his principal. I don't want to be presumptuous and make loud pronouncements, but definitely the issues highlighted about the fuel subsidy removal, about the realignment of the exchange rates, multiple exchange rates, will certainly be addressed by President-elect Bola Ahmed Tinebo. So I stand here, Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, imbued with a profound conviction that in unity, we are going to move a mountain. I implore on all Nigerians to give us the benefit of the doubt, to invest your trust and confidence in the Tinebu project, to believe in the Nigeria project. In spite of the division that permeated our politics in the last 2023 20, presidential elections, the most Christian of Northern states is Benue. Benue is 90% Christian, but the Nigerian candidate defeated the religious candidate in Benue State. We won two of the three Senate seats. We won 10 out of the 11 House of Representatives seats, and we won the governorship seat in Benue State. The most northern of northern states is Sokoto. The Nigerian candidate lost to the regional candidate by a mere fraction in Sokoto. We won two Senate seats in Sokoto, and we won the gubernatorial race in Sokoto. So finally, finally, Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, what binds us together to persist whatever that divides us? Thank you so much, and may God bless us all. Vice President elect Kashim Shetima GCON. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, just a couple of notifications. Uh, just to bring to you notice quickly that um, after the morning's events, that is, after the President has spoken, there'll be a photo shoot, and it will be in two batches. Let me just quickly acquaint you with that. That's after his speech. The president will be in a photo shoot with the vice president-elect, with President Uhuru Kenyatta, and four of the five contributors who spoke here today. They'll be in a photo shoot, and then... For the second part of it, they will be joined by the Secretary to the Government of the Federation, the Head of Service, the Deputy Speaker of the House of Representatives, the APC National Chairman, and the APC National Secretary. That's for the photo shoot. May I also bring to you notice that after his speech, the President would uh, be stepping in to... Take a look at the inauguration exhibition of Nigerian Arts and Crafts at the Executive Hall. He will declare that open. And once he has done that and taken his leave, other guests are encouraged to also 
go into the executive hall after the president has uh, done the business of declaring it open to also have a look at uh, the exhibition of Nigerian arts and crafts. That's at the executive hall. Now, Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, to now deliver his address, may I invite His Excellency Muhammadu Buhari, President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Please sit down. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Your Excellency Uhuru Mega Kenyatta, former President of the Republic of Kenya, Deputy Speaker, House of Representatives, the governors present here, members of the National Assembly. Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Honorable Ministers, Deputy Secretary General, United Nations President, President Africa Development Bank, Chairman and Principal Members of All Progressive Congress, Chief of the Senate Staff and the Service Chiefs, our Royal Fathers, Ladies and gentlemen, as we come to the close of this important inauguration lecture, I stand before you with profound sense of pride and gratitude. Today, we have embarked on a journey of introspection, enlightenment, and collective growth we have delved deep into the theme of deepening democracy for development and explored the lessons that will guide us as we transition to a new era. Throughout this lecture, we have recognized the challenges and divisions that have tested the very fabric of our nation. We have confronted the harsh realities of inequality, the persistence of corruption, and the imperative to empower all citizens. But more importantly, we have unearthed the transformative power of democracy and the immense potential it holds for our great nation. In the course of this lecture, we have learned that democracy is not merely a system of governance. It is a way of life. It requires active participation, inclusivity, and relentless pursuit of justice and fairness. We have understood that true democracy thrives when the voices of all citizens are heard, valued, and represented regardless of their background or social status. The underlying philosophy of this lecture has been rooted in the belief that our nation's progress rests on the place of unity, inclusivity, and shared responsibility. We have acknowledged that the task of nation building is a collective one transcending political affiliations and personal interests. It is a commitment to leaving no Nigerian behind, ensuring that every citizen feels the positive impact of good governance and enjoys the dividends of democracy. The lessons we have learned here 
are not mere intellectual exercises, but a call to action. As I prefer to hand over the reins of governance to the present elect on the 29th of May, I am filled with a renewed sense of hope hinged on the capacity of my successor, His Excellency Bola Ahmed Tinubu, to deliver on the assignment given to him by Nigerians. I am at the same time reminded of the immense responsibilities entrusted upon us as leaders and the tremendous potentials that lies within our great nation. We must heed the lessons of this lecture and translate them into concrete actions. We must continue to prioritize the welfare and well-being of our citizens, providing them with quality education, accessible health care, and sustainable livelihoods. We must fight against corruption in all its forms, unfolding the principles of transparency, accountability, and the rule of law. But above all, we must remain united. Our diversity is our strength, and it is through dialogue, understanding, and respect we can overcome our differences and forge a common path towards progress. Let us foster an environment where every Nigerian has an equal opportunity to thrive, regardless of their background, ethnicity, religion, or social status. As I conclude, I want to express my deep appreciation to the esteemed speakers, most especially our keynote speaker, His Excellency Uhuru Kenyatta, for once again <laughs> accepting my invitation to share his wealth of knowledge with us. Indeed, you are thought for a vocal lecture and the perspective shared by the panel of eminent Nigerians has left an indelible mark on our collective consciousness. I thank the Secretary to the Government of the Federation and members of his team for a job well done. <laughs> to the President-elect, I offer my heartfelt congratulations and assurance of unwavering support. I trust that you will lead our nation with integrity, vision, and a deep commitment to the ideas of democracy and national development. Let us remember that the true measure of our success lies not in the titles we hold or the positions we occupy, but on the positive impact we make on the lives of our fellow citizens. Together, let us march forward, guided by the lessons learned from this lecture, and build a Nigeria that is prosperous, inclusive, and anchored on the principles of democracy. Thank you and God bless the Federal Republic of Nigeria. The President will now be joined. The President will be joined in a photograph right now by the Vice President-elect, President Uhuru Kenyatta, and the five contributors. His Eminence Mohammed Saad Abubakar Sultan of Sokoto, Dr. Matthew Hassan Kuka, Dr. Akim Adishina, and Mr. Dio Israel. Thank <laughs> you.
The next photograph of the SGF, the head of service, the deputy speaker, the APC national chairman, and the national secretary of the APC will join them for the next session. Thank you. The national anthem. May we rise for the national anthem. This is Channels Television. You've been watching our live coverage of the 2023 Presidential Inauguration Lecture by former Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta. Please stay with us as we return to our other programming lined up for the day. Television will now go to River State for a debate broadcast of the commissioning of the Opobo Sanfil Land Reclamation Project and flag off of the Opobo Ring Road.
remain standing, may I invite Bishop Dasva Fubara to take the opening prayer. Let us pray. In Jesus' name, our Father in heaven, our faithful Father, the loving Father, we want to say thank you for whom you are, for what you are, for what you are doing. We thank you for joining masses. We thank you for giving us this day and bringing us safely here. For we commit everything to your hand. Above all, Lord, we thank you for the peace in River State. We thank you for giving us a man whom you have used to change things, not only in River State, but in Nigeria as a whole. We say, may them be blessed. We glorify you. And ask you, 